My precious Sunday is ruined because of my not-so-precious sister, Emma, who insisted on dragging me to church for some sister time. We walked in to see the priest rushing over. Welcome in. You must be our new member, Janet. Whoa! whoa just then, the holy statues nearby all fell over and shattered to pieces. It's a bad omen. She's a jinx. No, no, no! You devil! Get out of here! Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Hi, my name's Janet. If you think I'm a jinx too, you're seriously wrong. Because animators were one that last scene. Pause it right there and... See that? That's my sister, Emma. And fast forward a bit more. Pan over, please. There. That right there is the ringmaster behind my so-called bad luck. You must be wondering why I hadn't exposed Emma that day. It's because everyone is fooled by her naive Cinderella look and never believed how a living angel could do such mischievous deeds. But the truth is, she's the devil. She did everything to make me look like a walking disaster everywhere I go. But who am I, huh? That night, to get back at Emma, I hid under the bed till she was sound asleep, wrapped my icy cold hands around her ankles, jumped out from under the bed, and BOO! Emma screamed through the roof, and our parents walked into the room worried just to see me laughing hysterically. Right then, the police on patrol also barged in, thinking something real wrong went on in our house. We ended up spending the night trying to explain to them nothing happened, and they finally left. Do you know how many sleepless nights we've had just because of you girls' petty fights? That's it. I'm signing you both up to join a community farm from tomorrow. What? But Dad, I can't live amongst animals and dirt. For once, I agree with Emma. There's no way I'm going there. You're not going back till you learn to live with each other. Living with Emma 24-7? I'd much rather be the Jinx now. So the next morning, Mom and Dad drove us to the farm to live off the land and bond together. But look at this tranquility and picturesque scenery. Maybe coming here wasn't such a bad idea after all. Suddenly, a loud obnoxious track started playing from inside my suitcase, startling the animals, and they went rogue. Stop the music! But my suitcase was locked. I caught Emma smirking, pressing her phone, and the music suddenly stopped. Once everything was under control, the farmers gave me looks of disapproval. Just when I thought things couldn't be any worse, a trailer nearby slipped off and began to roll downhill, heading straight for an oblivious farmer. Emma immediately swooped in and pushed herself and the farmer out of harm's way just in the nick of time. Richard, are you okay? Oh, yes, thanks to this young lady. You saved my life. What a good luck charm you are. That trailer has been sitting there for ages without any problems. Why did it suddenly break just now? Oh, it's my sister. She has this reputation for bringing bad luck wherever she goes. I apologize on her behalf. No, 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 no! Don't listen to her! She's evil! That's not something you should say to your sister. Look at her! What an angel! Emma immediately activated her manipulating power. Aww! Come on, we got the nicest room for you. <laughs> hey, what about me? The next morning, I was told to milk the cows while Emma didn't even have to lift a finger, just wandering around and pulling pranks on me. In a panic, a guy appeared and helped me out. What happened here? The hoses are all snipped off. I'm so sorry about that. It's my sister's stupid prank to get me look like bad luck. Interesting. Oh well, we'll hand milk the cows until we get them replaced. Hand milk? That'd take forever. Emma's gonna have to pay. Hey, no need for that. I'll give you a hand. I'm Kai, by the way. He gave the bride a smile, and I instantly felt better. I'm Janet. Thanks for helping me, but... Which buttons do I push to get milk? Kai cracked up, and I felt like the dumbest thing in the world. I'm sorry, but that was so cute. Okay, you don't push any buttons. You squeeze it, like this. Just then, Sylvia walked by and saw us. Well, well, well. Who makes you smile like that, Kai? Janet, you are really something, huh? As she left, I felt my heart racing and saw Kai blushing also. Whew, it sure feels hot like summertime. So, Kai, how long have you been living here? Just recently. I'm actually a skier from the city too, but I came here due to some stuff. Come on, let's go sell the milk. Kai and I then made our way to the bustling market. Surprisingly, customers were eager to get their hands on our milk. I was ready to make my first hard-earned cash when suddenly... Ahem, <clears throat> you'd better watch out. You'd better not buy, better not drink this milk right here. 
Dinksy Janet's coming to town. The crowd buzzed with concern over our milk. Actually, I thought someone else was a jinx. You see, our milk is especially fresh today. All thanks to my good luck charm, Janet. She and I worked all morning to milk the cows by hand. Thanks to Kai's words, the crowd was excited again. Just like that, we sold out in just a few hours. Woohoo! But when we got home, people started praising Emma for bringing good luck to the business. Actually, it was Kai and me who milked the cows. And more thanks to Kai who did most of the heavy lifting. She has nothing to do with this. The room suddenly felt awkward and people started to look away. Only Sylvia cared to acknowledge us. I see. You two make a great team. What about us? I think we'll make a better team. Get off of me, you creep. Ouch. Feisty. Oh my gosh. Are you okay? Why are you acting like such an animal, Janet? I'm alright. She may be a bit cold right now, but she'll warm up to me in no time. Right, princess? Emma immediately gave me a death stare. Aiden, why are you here? I'm here for you, brother dearest. Mom and dad are worried sick back home. Holy cow, these two are related? But they're nothing alike. Well, it does explain why their tension was scorching up the room. Stop it, you two. Always with the bickering. It's getting late. Janet, will you go and lock the barn door? Oh, oh yes, definitely. But before I reached the barn, a hand suddenly pulled me back. Keep your claws off of Aiden. He's mine. Oh, I see. You're smitten with him, huh? Well, too bad, because he seems to like me instead, sister. How dare you? Emma dashed ahead of me towards the barn, turned all the lights on, blew on the deafening whistle, and the sheep went wild again. I desperately tried to stop the panic herd, but no use. Only when the farmer showed up and let the shepherd dog do his job was the scene under control. This is all your fault. You'll bring us nothing but bad luck and chaos. That's not true. I was trying to help while this was Emma's doing. Stop with all the blaming and start learning some manners, will you? <laughs> I was stunned. Behind Richard, Emma grinned slyly. She won this time, but not for long. Because how about I steal Emma's crush, aka Aiden, right in front of her? <laughs> Well, actually, I didn't really have to steal anything, because Aiden always found his way to me first, and he also brought Kai along. It was like something was going on between them, and they kept fighting to get my attention. They showered me with food, fought over the seat next to me at dinner, and wouldn't let me lift anything remotely heavy. It was getting a little annoying, but seeing Emma fuming with jealousy each time is so worth it. <laughs> One afternoon, Kai and I were picking flowers in the field when he gently tucked a flower in my hair. It looks good on you. Then, he lifted my face and leaned in closer. I was floating in the summer breeze, ready for a kiss, when we both got shaken up by the engine revving. Aiden? So pretty thing. Wanna go out with a date with me? She's with me. Can't you see? Well, maybe I'm blinded. Blinded by my love for you. Um, how about you two can show some brotherly love and go together, huh? Then I walked off, only to see Emma's blonde head sticking out from the flowers. Hey Aiden, on second thought, I'd love to go with you, shall we? Driving away, I could see Emma furious, and Kai, with sad eyes following me? But the thing was, this was hella awkward. I don't feel like flirting if there was no Emma, and he, well, I don't know, couldn't stand it anymore. So I told him to stop at this random clothing store and insisted he try on this fancy suit. Whoa, you cleaned up nicely, huh? Do I not look good usually? Well, you kind of look like a hooligan. <laughs> Is that genuine joy I see on your face? What? I'm always smiling. Oh, really? You and Kai were ready to bite each other's heads off just then. You don't know everything about us, Janet. I know you have a thing for him, but I can never let you two be together. Not this time. We came back to the farm to see Emma waiting for us, all agitated. You tramp! Isn't Kai enough for you? Now you're playing the double game with Aiden? And you're just jealous because Aiden doesn't like you. That's right. I only have eyes for Janet. She and Kai were never together. So quit sticking your nose into our business. Emma couldn't utter a word. For the first time, she seemed so vulnerable, then rushed away in tears. Look what you did, brother. Playing with both Emma's and Janet's hearts is a low blow. You're one to talk. Wasn't the thing with Tina your low blow? Tina? Tina who? Tina was your crush. I had nothing to do with her. It's about time you get over that. That's not what Tina said. She told me you flirted with her, and you abandoned her when she's falling for you. She lied, okay? She wanted to use you against me, and never once reciprocated her obsessive behaviors. I just want to leave everything behind and enjoy my life here, with her. So Aiden, please, just let us be. 
Too bad. She seems to like me instead. <laughs> Can't you see? She doesn't care if her sister likes me. She still chose me over you. Dang, those words hit me hard. I didn't realize what I'd done to Emma all along. <sighs> it's time to end all these silly sibling conflicts. Guys, stop. Can't you see her hurting each other just like Emma and I? Janet, this jerk plays with you and Emma. He deserved a fist or two. No, Kai. I'm not exactly innocent either. I was also using Aiden to get back at Emma. You what? I know, I know. But all these petty revenge doesn't bring us any good. No one wins at all. And honestly, I regretted having hurt Emma. And so should you guys. <laughs> you want this golden boy to drop his sky-high ego? Yeah, good luck with that. I'm not a golden boy, Aiden. <laughs> Are you kidding me? With all your success and skiing trophies, Mom and Dad can even see me behind all that. When you left home, they freaked out and made me go looking for you. Do you know the reason I quit skiing and left home? Because Mom and Dad wouldn't stop pressuring me. It's suffocating. Every time I stand on the rink, my whole body shakes like crazy. I'm not perfect, Aiden. And I did not want to take away any attention from you. I'm sorry if you ever feel that way. Well, I didn't know. You could have told us what you'd gone through. To who? To Mom and Dad? The ones who keep pushing and nagging? Sorry I wasn't there for you. Heck, I was the worst. Right? You two could work this out. Now if you excuse me, I have my own sibling conflict to resolve. I was about to leave when we heard Emma screaming. Fire! Fire! Help! We immediately rushed to her, and the fire already caught on the haystack. It was spreading fast. I... I accidentally knocked over the oil lamp. What do we do now? You go call the firefighter. Aiden, you go get everyone here. Us two, we will go get water. Go, go, go! Kai and I tried our best to pour bucket after bucket of water, but it only stopped the fire from spreading, not put it out. We almost exhausted ourselves when the farmers arrived along with the firefighter. And luckily, after half an hour, everything was under control. Phew! But then, the farmers started surrounding me. It was because of you, isn't it? Every time incidents happen, you're always on the scene. Coincident? I think not. There we go again. But this time, I'm too beat up to even say anything. Then, there was Emma, petrified in fear, so I used every last effort to stand up. That's right, I knocked over the oil lamp and caused this fire. What are you doing? It's okay, I'm used to this. No, it was my fault. Janet's just trying to take the fall. In fact, this whole time, I was the one doing all the damage and blaming it on Janet. Was this for real? Emma standing up for me? You! Is this some kind of childish joke? You could have really harmed everyone here. This is our life work, not your girls' playground. I... I'm truly sorry. That's it. Tomorrow morning, you'll have to leave here for good. Both of you. We had no choice but to call our parents to pick us up. Meanwhile, I gotta pack my stuff. Hey, I know I've been mean to you since forever, so why did you still take the blame for me? I'm just tired of petty fights. Besides, I feel bad for stealing Aiden away from you. I don't have any feelings for him, and I don't think he falls for me either. I just wanted to mess with you. I figured. Um, I actually heard what you guys were talking about before, and it hit me hard. You know, I used to enjoy being the only child. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, when you came, it felt like all the attention and love was stripped away from me. I felt so lonely and jealous, so I decided to make you the center of attention, but in the worst way possible. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's all in the past now. I just want us to get along. And me not be called a jinx anymore. You got it. The next morning, our parents arrived all angry. We were so ready for a long-term grounding. But once they saw us holding hands, they were pleased. Honey, I think your plan worked. I knew it. You two can be little troublemakers, but deep down, you still love each other. Come on, let's go home. Can we just wait for a few minutes? I don't want to leave without saying goodbye to Kai. But what took him so long? I gotta get going. Then Kai finally showed up. Wait up. I rushed out of the car and ran to give him a big hug. I thought you wouldn't come to say goodbye. How could I not? Especially when you forget the most important thing. Really? What is it? It's me, you silly. Oh, you're coming back to the city? Yes, I have a reason to be back now. To the city, to skiing, and what is it? It's you. Suddenly, a tree fell over right beside us and crashed the mailbox, causing all of the mail to fly out. Huh, <laughs> you really are bad luck, aren't you? Hey, that tree was already rotten. And don't you think that it barely missing us means I'm good luck? I'm just kidding. It took a lot of effort, but I finally got into the military school that I've always dreamed of. I'm now one step closer to being an actual soldier. Ah! <laughs> hey, midget. Move it. You're blocking my way. What? How dare he? This rude guy deserved a lesson. 
Suddenly, a hand grabbed my fist. I looked up. Oh, it was some tough-looking guy with tanned skin and bright eyes. He picked up my backpack and said, First, you have to know your enemy. He's Eric. Before I could reply to this boy, he walked off. At that moment, the siren sounded, and I quickly got in line. Choose your groups. You have one minute. Looking around, I saw two guys looking as awkward as I did. So I shuffled over to them, and we became a group. Oh, but wait. Why did that guy who picked up my backpack team up with that obnoxious jerk Eric? It turned out our groups would be our roommates, and we were placed in room P02, which was right opposite Eric's room. My roomies are Tom, who was forced here due to his family's military background, and Henry, a notorious playboy who was sent here by his father to stop his opulent ways and learn how to lead a disciplined life. What about me? Well, I'm a girl. My disguise is awesome, right? You see, I have a twin brother, Jack. So I took his identity, and voila, here I am. Ever since I was a little kid, I've loved martial arts and always dreamed of one day becoming a soldier. I thought life here would be great, but it certainly had its challenges. Every morning, whatever the weather, we have to wake up at 5 a.m. and run around the yard. The showers were ice cold, and worse still, because I'm a girl, I had to sneak into the freezing shower block in the dead of night when no one was around. And physical education here is surely rough. Although I train a lot, I'm still always ranked at the bottom. I also struggle to finish the massive meal portions here. Not only do we have to work out loads, but our chores are also endless. Cooking, gardening, ironing, helping out with constructions. I was a novice at these things, so I was super clumsy and messed them up. Luckily, I always had Tom and Henry on my side. Tom is a nerd. And although he doesn't like studying here, his grades are top of the class, and he gives me the answers to the questions I don't know. As for Henry, he gets top grades in PE class. And even though he teases me a lot, he's the one who protects me from Eric. Speaking of Eric, he's a jerk who teases weaker students in school. But he gets away with it for one simple reason. His dad's in charge. And as for that boy that warned me on my first day, yeah. Turns out he's called Ellis. I can't quite work him out, even though he often hangs out with Eric and participates in his meaningless dumb pranks. One time, after Eric knocked a younger kid over, I saw Ellis go back and check he was okay. Hmm. Friend or foe? Who knows? Today we have Taekwondo class. Perfect. I quickly challenged a smug-looking Eric. Too bad he doesn't know I have a black belt. Ha! <laughs> and as I predicted... I kicked his butt in just three moves. K.O. I walked over to my two fellows with a big triumphant smile on my face when Henry suddenly rushed forward and pushed Eric down. Turns out he was sneaking up on me from behind. Nice try, coward. But sorry, dude. We three always have each other's back. We were laughing about Eric's defeat when the lunch bell went. But, oh no. The room was locked from the outside. Eric has to be behind this. No worries. The food here sucks anyway, Tom said while pulling a bunch of food out from under his bed. <laughs> Again, Tom? You've already been punished twice this week for sneaking food in here. Suddenly, there were noises outside. I went closer to the door to listen when it burst open and in stepped an officer. I stepped into the corridor to see everybody was gathered around whispering. While Eric was on the ground looking pale like he'd just seen a ghost. Oh my god. The door of room P01, Eric's room, had weird scratches all over it. It looks like those scratches spell out a word. Jacob. So there's a monster named Jacob. Well, that's comforting. P02! You all missed lunch, so I want five laps around the yard. And also five points are deducted for bringing in outside food. Ugh! Points deducted again? At this rate, we'd never gain access to the entertainment room. Oh, here we keep scores between rooms, just like in Harry Potter with the house's points. It's quite a competition. At the end of the week, the room with the highest score gets access to the entertainment room. You know, watching TV or using social media are considered a huge reward in the strict school, but it's hard to earn points. Meanwhile, you can get them deducted for any reason. 
from me taking a shower at the wrong time to Henry skipping theory lessons, and now Tom and his snacks. Ugh, what does Jacob mean? Anyway, seeing Eric freak out like that was hilarious. Jacob is a name. Don't you see that, Jack? He's Eric's ex-roommate. I heard that he's missing. Hey, Tom, is there anything you don't know? Hmm, I see. But why did that missing Jacob scare Eric so much? We're never going to get into the entertainment room. It's all work, work, work in this place. Who cares about that stupid room? This weekend, there's a prom at the local girls' school. I have a step-by-step plan for us. We'll sneak into the school milk delivery truck to get there. Then I can finally talk to some lovely girls instead of those aunties in the kitchen. That sounds good. Hey, maybe you'll even find your first love there. Right, Jack? Huh, they had no idea. Anyway, the thought of getting out of school for a bit was appealing. That weekend, Henry stole some of the gardener's casual clothes, and then we hid in the milk delivery truck to attend the prom. As soon as we got there, Henry had already got himself all smitten with a cute blonde, while Tom spent all his time debating World War II with a girl majoring in world history. As for me, I really enjoyed all those tasty cupcakes. But why wouldn't the girls quit pestering me? I guess it proves that I look quite manly, right? We gotta go. The bus to our school is about to come. Change to your uniform. You have one minute. I quickly got changed, then ran after them so fast, I bumped into someone, and we both fell to the ground. I was in such a rush that I could only say sorry, pick up my dog tag, and run out into the road to catch the bus back to school. Where did you guys just get back from? They just helped clean up the cafeteria, sir. I just got back from there. Hearing this, the officer stopped questioning us. But, huh? Why did Ellis help us? Isn't he meant to be on Eric's side? While indulging in thoughts about it, I took out the dog tag from my pocket and was about to put it around my neck. But wait, it's not mine. Look, guys, this dog tag has the name Jacob on it. I quickly showed them the dog tag and explained the incident to them. I must have picked up that guy's tag by mistake. Could it belong to the missing Jacob? Or was it merely coincidence? I mean, Jacob's a popular name, right? The next day, as we were helping to distribute food in the kitchen, there were noises coming from the dining area. As soon as I went out, I saw Eric sitting on the floor, shivering in fear. Next to him was his bowl of soup splattered everywhere. At first, I thought he was playing some tricks to get us to clean up. But no, looking at the way he ran out of the cafeteria in panic, something must have happened. I bent down to pick up the bowl. Oh my god. And it was a dog tag with Jacob's name on it. But the dog tag I took by mistake yesterday is still in my pocket. Hmm, what's going on? Eric was so preoccupied with the Jacob stuff, he didn't have time to taunt us. So our room got the highest score for the first time. Which means we would finally get to experience the entertainment room. But as soon as we reached the lobby of the utility area, something didn't feel right. A bunch of kids were buzzing in front of the entertainment room where the hazy smoke was coming from. Thinking there was a fire, we rushed to put it out. But no, it was only a smoke bomb. Inside the entertainment room, Eric and his friends were fainting. People splashed water on his face, but as soon as he woke up and saw the words Jacob burned black on the wall, he blacked out again. Huh? Who did this? Was it Jacob? Was he not missing after all? Today we have P.E., but I'm on my period, so I made up an excuse to go to the school's infirmary instead. On the way, I happened to see Eric with his group of friends. I think Jacob's spirit is back to take revenge on me. You know that time? I locked him in the old warehouse and he just disappeared without a trace since then. Is it possible that he was- Stop talking nonsense. Maybe someone who knows what happened in the past wants to mess with you. I even took his clothes away. Oh god, he would surely want to haunt me. Oh my gosh, it all made sense now. Suddenly a large hand muffled me, then dragged me away. You better shut your mouth and keep this a secret. It was Ellis, Eric's sidekick. What a faithful servant. What if I don't? Especially since I met Jacob. What did you just say? You don't believe it? 
Here, I bumped into someone, and he dropped this dog tag. As for the one in Eric's soup bowl, I think it's just a fake. Ellis trembled as he took the tag from my hand and quickly left. Was he going to snitch on Eric or something? That night, while I was having dinner, Eric was back to jerk mode again, and he dumped his leftovers on my tray. The two sides clashed, and we all ended up with an hour's detention. The punishment sucked. They locked each of us in a tiny room containing one chair and left us to think about our wrongdoings for a whole hour. The next morning, the officer knocking on the door woke us up. Eric was missing, and we were the number one suspects. This was ridiculous. What did his disappearance have to do with us? I told Henry and Tom about the other day when I overheard Eric and his friends. So Eric teased Jacob, so now he'd returned for vengeance? Feeling suspicious, we snuck into the school's abandoned warehouse. Yep, there was Eric all tied up and with a rag in his mouth. It's Jacob. His spirit has returned. He wants to harm me. Help me! Ha! Huh. Look at that arrogant Eric being all scaredy cat. Call me Captain. Uh, no. Call me Farther. Then I'll let you go. Tom and Henry burst out laughing. But Eric just stammered and then everything started to go blurry. Then I must have blacked out. When the three of us groggily came round, we saw that the only thing left there of Eric's was his uniform. As soon as we got back to school, we heard from the others about how Eric had appeared in just his tidy-whitey. Everyone gloated to see the overbearing Eric lose his face. From now on, he wouldn't dare tease anyone again. But this was the exact same way Eric used to pick on Jacob. So, Jacob did this? Was he back? Actually, I already knew who was behind all this. You dropped this at the warehouse, right? Ellis looked at me surprised and asked how I knew. We actually snuck into the main office to find information about Jacob before we got to the warehouse. And as soon as I saw his picture, I knew right away there was some sort of close connection between Ellis and Jacob. Call it twin senses. It turns out that Jacob was Ellis's brother. During his time at this school, Eric made his life a misery. But everything was kept a secret because Eric's the principal's son. So, Ellis enrolled at this school to get answers. Ellis took the dog tag back and handed over a picture of me with my twin brother. And this must be yours. I picked it up on the first day of school when you dropped your backpack. You remember? Oh my god. Was this for real? I snatched the photo and quickly put it away when I saw an officer approaching. We should get to know each other better, right? Since we both know each other's secrets. Whatever. Anyway... I don't hate Ellis, and Eric deserved it, so it didn't matter who did that. I turned my head to look at Ellis. He smiled as if he was challenging me. Uh-oh. I had a feeling my life here... Hi, I'm Vicky, the only daughter of a billionaire. Also the sole heir from the third generation of an English aristocracy. Growing up, I was always referred to as Nepo Baby, but this is so unfair. If I had one sentence to sum up my entire life, it would be, well, that didn't go as planned. Before we start, please like and subscribe. I used to live the life of a princess. My house staff was on hand 24 hours to cater to all of my needs. And the biggest decision I had to make each day was to choose which car to go to school in. Still, I wasn't Regina George everyone wanted me to be. I was friendly to everyone and took both my education and my talent seriously. From an early age, I found a huge love for painting. You see, my daddy even invited global superstars over just so they could pose for me. Then, it struck me like a bolt of lightning when my daddy got involved in a messy lawsuit and ended up in jail. As a result, we had to kiss goodbye to everything. Yes, the mansion, the staff, but the worst blow was losing Brad, the butler's son who happened to be my boyfriend. My sweetie pie, I will collect the stars from the skies if it leads me back to you. Well, a girl gotta survive. So I did what I had to. I sold all of my beloved clothes and jewelry. But holy cow, all those Pradas, Gucci's, and Tiffany's still weren't enough to cover a week in a five-star hotel. Hey, use this. Miss, your card has been declined. Clearly you have insufficient funds and therefore must leave. Excuse me? The nerve, the ingratitude. 
I used to be one of their best customers. It wasn't as if I was the second inventing Anna or anything. So that's how I ended up here, under this bridge full of homeless people, desperately waiting for Brad to come back to me. In the meantime, at least I still had my paintings, which could be my ticket out of here, right? But Jesus, look! Those people kept taking them to smash cockroaches, while others even used them as firewood! Then, one day, as my belly was arguing with me over the lack of food, this charity group showed up. They came to distribute food to the homeless. I scrambled to my feet to ask for some, but was stopped by this woman. Look at your flashy outfit. You can't take food off the needy. How inappropriate. No, no, no. I'm homeless too. Just then, a whiff of the Labo Santal 33 filled the air, and a luxurious lady emerged from the crowd. She waved off the mean woman, then peered at my drawing. Did you paint these? Yes. I've been painting since I was a child. I've painted everyone from Taylor Swift to Ronaldo. Impressive indeed. I'm Diana, a widow of a great fortune. How would you like to come and live with me in exchange for sharing your artistic brilliance in my daily portrait? I was speechless for a few secs, then agreed right away. I was obviously destined to be rich, so it seems I couldn't escape my fate. I arrived at the villa, thinking that this was awesome and I'd finally landed back on my feet. But then... The euphoria was replaced with a gut-wrenching blow when Diana introduced me to her fiancé. Brad? Right after the awkward introduction, I pulled Brad away and confronted him. How could you cheat on me like this? I'll tell Diana. We broke up. Besides, having exes is normal. If you tell Diana I'm your ex, then it's you she'll throw out, not me. I couldn't believe the cheek of this guy. And you know what? We never broke up. I just couldn't spend another moment stuck with this jerk, so I decided to paint Diana a portrait as a thank you and then leave forever. Only, she really loved my painting. Thinking back to those glum days under the bridge, I realized, well, Brad was here, but so was a warm bed, steady meals, and someone who genuinely loved my art. This place was big enough to avoid him anyway, right? So far, so good. Well, until one day. All I did was ask the maid to get me a clean paintbrush when a guy got all grouchy with me. You have legs. Do it yourself. Who are you to talk to me like that? Soon to be the owner of this mansion? Any problem? Leave her alone. It's what the staff are here for anyway. The room suddenly bristled with tension as Brad and that guy exchanged hostile looks. Then he coldly walked away. Suddenly, Brad pulled me out to a corner. Vicky, sorry for hiding it from you, but I have no feelings for Diana. I'm here to spy on her, as she's the reason your father's in jail. I'm here to find evidence and help him regain his honor. Wow! What? I know, it's hard to believe, but I need to cooperate with me. That dude is Charles, Diana's son. He'll try to mess with me by all means, so we need to stop him before he does. It made sense now. I knew Brad loved me really and wouldn't pick some old woman over me. Then he told me his plan. He'd continue seducing Diana and persuade her to get me to tutor Charles. While I had to befriend Charles to get information out of him, I felt kind of nervous, but the chance to clear Daddy's name left me with no doubts. However, Charles wasn't the approachable type. He was so curt and rude. And no matter how wide I flashed my friendly smile, I always heard no more than six words from him. Let's do some still life painting today, shall we? You do what you want. I was trying my best to teach him, but he doodled on the page and always came up with the worst drawings I've ever seen. Then one day, he suddenly insisted we go outside for some outdoor portraits, and he to draw me. So my plan did work! Yes! I excitedly stood in the bay window and did an elegant pose. It was sweltering standing there, but I endured it for the art. But it had been four hours and he didn't seem to have finished. I couldn't stand any longer, so I rushed to him and dropped my jaw to see what his canvas was. Totally blank! I. Am. Furious! <sighs> Calm down, Vicky. Perhaps Charles was like an onion, with multiple layers waiting to be peeled away. So I decided to take a more psychological approach. I asked Diana for Charles's photo book and saw a family photo. This must be Charles's father. I'd paint it, in the hope this thoughtful gesture would move him somehow. On Charles's birthday, I happily gave him the beautifully framed painting. Unexpectedly, upon seeing that, his face darkened, and he had this fiery look in his eyes. He furiously threw the painting to the ground and yelled at me. Disappear! I can't stand you! What the? Fine then! Why is this guy gonna be so rude? I spent all week on that painting. What a psycho! I was packing my bags when Diana came into my room. 
She explained that the man in the photo wasn't Charles's father, but her ex-boyfriend. Charles's father died when he was little. Then her ex was the one who had taken care of Charles since then. To Charles, he was the world. That kid was even closer to him than me. But then we broke up, and he vanished without as much as a word. Charles has been hostile and distant ever since. I didn't know behind his rocky exterior was such a bitter truth, so I immediately found him. Charles, I I'm sorry. Go. I might look terrible now, but I was once my father's princess. He gave me everything I could ever ask for, except his time. My parents divorced early, and I was left alone, just like you, Charles. This loneliness, this yearning for a family bond, I share with you. Seeing his hand loosen, I continued. My intention was never to belittle you. All I wanted was to bridge the chasm of misunderstanding between us. Charles still stayed silent. But his facial muscles had relaxed, and when his gaze met mine, he slammed the door shut. So I decided to stay. And even though Charles continued being a grouch towards me, he stopped with the pranks. I also noticed that when Charles focused on something, he turned into a different person. He always stuck his tongue out, which looked adorable. Watching Charles drawing as if he was fighting with the paper, I came here and guided him. But suddenly our eyes met. He has such dreamy eyes. Oh no, Vicky. Less of that. You were here to prove my daddy's innocence and get back to the old life. As for me and Brad, we had to make do with grabbing moments together when we could. When this is over, we can vow to be together forever and have a wedding more lavish than any of the Kardashians. My love, you must be patient. We will be together properly soon. However, when everyone was around, Brad kept up the lovey-dovey pretense with Diana. I knew it was totally fake, but I couldn't help but feel annoyed. I couldn't just sit there smiling like everything was peachy. So after I finished the painting, I followed Brad, intending to ask him what the next step was after I successfully approached Charles. When I spotted him sneakily talking to someone, "Hey, Pop. Yeah, Diana's like putty in my hand. Vicky complicated things, but I came up with a plan to deceive her. I thought that little pest'd be long gone by now, but seems Charles hasn't kicked her out. Any ideas?" The fury whirled like a tornado inside me. I instantly charged at him and smacked him in the face. What you? Wait till Diana finds out about this. Oh yeah. If you challenge me, then be prepared to lose. Say hi to your bridge pals for me. I immediately found Diana and exposed all about Brad to her. But her face suddenly turned serious. I knew you'd say anything to divert from the truth. But I know you stole money from me. The maid found it in your room. Stole? What? What are you talking about? Then I looked at Brad and saw him smirking. That conniving mastermind! Before I could try and defend myself, a staff member hurried in and passed Diana a letter. Charles was missing. Everyone was freaking out and refused to hear me out, and the chaos left me powerless as my stuff was dumped outside the villa. I ended up right back where I started and had a complete meltdown. Worst of all, I was worried about Charles. Was he home yet? The next morning, I was trying to sketch something when, out of nowhere, Charles appeared. He handed me the keys to this small but cozy apartment and told me it was all mine. Stunned and grateful, also, I couldn't stand but hugged him hard. By the way, where did you go? Nowhere special. Felt suffocated, so I left. This time, Charles was like a different person towards me. He visited me every day and even helped me sell my paintings. Over time, my feelings for him grew, and we started dating. Our relationship was filled with warmth and affection, and every moment spent together felt like a dream come true. Only, I felt so guilty keeping my dating history with Brad a secret from him. But the fear of losing him loomed over me. If he knew I'd approached him with hidden motives at the beginning, he'd despise me forever. But I had to at least tell him something. Be careful around Brad. I don't think he's a good guy. I know. He's a gold digger that's part of a romance scam ring, targeting rich women to blackmail them. Wow. Charles sure knew his stuff. Hang on, does it mean that Brad intended on blackmailing me too when I'd been rich? I'm going to expose him at the wedding ceremony. Come with me. Today is D-Day. The grand hall was drowned in the ethereal glow of lights. Standing in the center were Brad and Diana, ready to exchange lifelong vows. All eyes were fixed on them. Out of a sudden, the whole hall went dark, and an anonymous face appeared on the screen behind them. Tonight, we bring the spotlight on our group. Unbeknownst to many, our Brad Thomas is, in reality, Jackson North, born and raised in Pennsylvania by his father, Richie North. 
the ringleader of scams to trick rich women into marriage and con them out of their fortune. Then the evidence of Brad being affectionate with innocent victims started appearing on the screen. After that, the spotlight immediately stopped on Brad, who was about to flee the scene. Diana roared in anger, rushing there right then, and flung a glass of wine right at his face. The whole crowd started to murmur. Hang on, everyone. The party's not over yet. Check their menus to reveal the other accomplice. Everyone frantically checked, but then looked bewildered to see all the menus were empty. All except for mine, where there was a photo of me and Brad. So since the beginning, Charles already knew about my relationship with Brad? And he thinks I'm Brad's accomplice? I turned to Charles, but he immediately let go of my hand. We're over. This whole time, Charles played me like a hurtful trick, and even thought me capable of something truly awful. I messaged him to meet me by this lake where we used to go. It had been one hour, but he hadn't shown up. This might be the final nail in the coffin of our relationship. Just as I was about to let go, I saw him trudging towards me. Charles, listen to me. I'm not with Brad. I tried warning you about him. I heard the whole sneaky conversation of you two. Your love words and your filthy plan on my family. Then my private detective sent me those photos of you both together that proved me right. You hired someone to spy on me? Not you, Brad. That's why I left home. I thought you were my friend. And I thought we were more than friends. Brad and I did date in the past, but that's all. He tried to use me just like he used others. My feelings for you are real. You have to trust me. So? I didn't know about the scam. I'm sorry I ever fell for Brad's lies and first approached you. He told me your mom was involved with my father's downfall, and I guess I still wanted my daddy to be innocent that I stupidly believed him. Charles didn't utter a word. He just turned around and left. But hang on! May I ask, why didn't you publicize my face in that picture with Brad? I just wanted you to know what it felt like to be hurt, but I couldn't bear to see you hurt either. Let me go. I need some time. Then he left me there, watching him disappear in the dark as the world around me collapsed. After the rain, the sun finally shines again. The police finally caught up with Brad and his dad and locked them both up. Diana tracked me down and apologized to me. She asked me to go back to the villa and paint for her, but I refused. I can't keep on being so trusting and relying on others so much. It's time for me to believe in myself and stand on my own two feet. And more importantly, I couldn't face him anymore. Hi, it's Vicky again, but in a fancier version. After all the sweat and tears, I finally made it as an artist. I was just chosen to collaborate on an important art project with this big company, and my life would turn a new page upon opening this door. Charles! How long is this gonna take? So much for taking care of me. Lex, starting today, I'm locking your phone and laptop away. Cruel! Isn't one leg cast enough punishment? Excuse me, you don't deserve to have a say in this. If you hadn't bought our daughter that death trap motorbike in the first place, she'd still be intact. Yeah, sorry for making sure she doesn't grow up boring like her mom. Yeah, another lecture on how irresponsible I was eventually turned into a quarrel between mom and dad instead. They stopped only when mom needed to leave for her business trip in Egypt. I'm done arguing with you. I have a flight to catch. I've got my eye on you, young lady. All the way from Egypt? That's kind of hard. Well, at least Dad's here, so I won't be by myself. The next morning, I woke up to see a note stuck to the fridge. Alex, I'm shooting my new movie in Spain for a few months. There is a strict no phone policy to avoid leaks. So if it isn't urgent, don't call me. Love, Dad. Seriously? Choosing work over me? Why am I still surprised? That's when you get when you have a world-famous actor dad and an award-winning photographer mom. They're rarely home, and whenever they are, they're constantly at each other's throats. All the more reason for me to hang out with my biker gang. I love motorcycles. They're my only getaway. But that's how I messed up my leg. In my defense, I could totally nail that trick and win their stupid bet if it wasn't for that bumpy road. However, not a single one of my homies has checked on me since then. Not even my boyfriend, Blake. But what's really bumming me out is that school's out for summer, yet I can hardly move. So, bored out of my mind, I came up with a new way to entertain myself, which was playing candid camera on this whole suburbia. 
Thanks to my mom's camera, I had eyes on the newlyweds Cunninghams on the right, the carpenters on the left, a few other houses, and ooh, tiny Timmy across the street. I swear to god, I almost thought some hunky guy had just moved in. My childhood friend Tiny Timmy had officially grown into Timothy. He looked just like a muscular version of Timothy Chalamet. Then Tim suddenly sat up and we accidentally made eye contact. Awkward. Looking good, handsome. He's even cuter when he smiles. Oh, he's replying. Even better up close. That's bold, Timmy. Too bad though. Sorry, lame. Tim looks confused at first. Then when he saw my cast, he immediately leaves the room. Huh? A broken leg is enough to scare him off? He's lame. Then the doorbell rang. Hey, that took a while. You're here? Of course, you need to have a closer look. And could use a hand. Or a leg. Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> come help this damsel in distress. From then on, Tim came over every day to help me out around the house. He'd been really helpful and even tried riding my motorcycle so I didn't have to sit idle for too long. Other than that bulked up body, he's still the friend I knew back in the day. We still had so much fun playing video games and watching movies together. You have to watch Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. It's nuts. Actually, I thought you might be into Ladybird. Such a heartwarming coming-of-age story. Ew, no way. Timothy Chalamet is in it. Okay, sold. But how do you know that it'd sway me? I just do. Like how I know you spy on me from time to time, which, by the way, is super creepy. Yeah, right. As if he didn't intentionally leave his blinds open while working out, Mr. Shy Guy. One day, as usual, me and Tim were hanging out, when suddenly my dear boyfriend Blake made a noisy entrance. Babe, you won't believe this. There's a raising tournament going on in the Upper West Side. You have to come. What's going on here? Sup. What do you mean, sup? Who's this little brat? Oh, this is Tim. Tim, this is Blake. Say hi. Hi. I don't care. What do you think you're doing? Watch your tongue. You've been ignoring me for weeks, and now you show up raving on about some dumb street racing contest? You don't even remember that I broke my leg, do you? But, but, you're mine! Blake was fuming like a bull ready for battle and about to throw hands at Tim, but he stopped his fist midair. A defeated-looking Blake fled off as soon as he got out of Tim's grip. Coward. I apologized to Tim for dragging him into this mess, and he was surprisingly cool about it. Just curious, how did Blake and you become a thing? He's the leader of the biker gang, so I thought he was cool, but honestly, I never expected our relationship to last, just like every other couple's. Exhibit A, my parents. I see. My dad's a good example as well. Then Tim revealed that his dad left his mom for another woman last year, which really upset him. I could relate so much to his situation. Maybe being locked up at home wasn't so bad after all, since we had the chance to catch up on everything. But the following morning, when I was chilling in my room, something horrible caught my eye. Something blonde. It looked like she was returning a hoodie to Tim. What kind of friend borrows a hoodie and acts like that around each other? Let's see what he has to say for himself. Who's that blonde? What was she doing at your place today? What? Who? She might look like strawberry shortcake, but don't be fooled. Whatever love you two might think you have will soon fade. That sweetness will turn sour in no time. Tim just burst out laughing. What's so funny? What made you think so? You don't even know Annabelle. <laughs> don't believe me? See for yourself. I then showed him all of the secrets I'd uncovered in our seemingly quiet neighborhood. First off, the couple from number 9 were both having affairs. The daughter from number 11 was using her boyfriend to hide her real relationship with another girl. And last but not least, the Carpenters, who seemed like suburban couples goal, actually had a far from blissful life due to Mr. Carpenter's drinking problem. In conclusion, there's no such thing as real love. I see your point, but on the other side of the spectrum, genuine love does exist. Tim points the camera towards the Cunninghams. Hmm, I'm not buying their poster couple act. Then, one day, Tim said he had to work overtime at the library to prepare for an event with, you guessed it, Annabelle only. I had to hide my anger as I watched him drive off with Blondie. With nothing else to do, I decided to watch the Cunninghams. Jeez, how could they seem so lovey-dovey all the time? I wanted to take my mind off of Tim, but the more I observed them, the more I thought about him with that Barbie. 
That's when I saw a book that Tim borrowed for me from the library. Looks like it's time to return it. I Ubered there, but there are many people here as well. Why did Tim say that the two of them would be here alone? Tim's face turned into the scream when he saw me. Didn't think I could get this far? Hi, don't mind me. I'm just here to return this. You should have just given it to me. Oh god, no. I can see that you're busy with... Annabelle, isn't it? Yeah. How do you know my name? Oh, let's see. You remind me of that creepy doll who's also an absolute nightmare. Tim then immediately dragged me away. See? He's caring for me, not you, Annie. However, the fun was interrupted right away when I saw Blake outside. Time for you to pay. Tim immediately stood between Blake and me, but to our surprise, Blake signaled for his goons hiding close by to show themselves. Clearly outnumbered, I tried to stop the situation from getting worse. Let's be civilized here. We can sort this out without violence. You're right, babe. We can settle this with a bet. Whoever can do the trick that broke Lex's leg and top it off with the Akira slide can have her fair and square. The loser has to back down. First of all, I'm not some kind of trophy. Second of all, that stunt is incredibly dangerous. Right, Tim? Sounds worth it, though. Have both of you lost your minds? Tim went first, and even though he flunked it, he managed to land without a scratch, while Blake landed on his face. Of course, that fiasco got the whole gang so embarrassed, they scrammed immediately. But I was still so annoyed. Congratulations, you won absolutely nothing. Not that I didn't care about him, I just couldn't stand his recklessness anymore. The next day, I was woken up by a doorbell. So, what are you here for? Sorry about last night. But if you stayed longer, I could have told you that I did what I did because I like you. Romantic styles. I don't even remember since when, but I do remember how sad I was when we stopped hanging out. Believe it or not, I started working out just to impress you. Whoa, what? Tim explained that nothing was going on between Annabelle and him. They were simply co-workers. And he made up that whole thing about being alone with her at the library to see my reaction. What do you say? I can make you believe in love. Tim, don't be ridiculous. Love isn't anything like the movies. It's merely a temporary chemical reaction in your brain that makes you think you're really feeling it. Come on, just give it a chance. No, look at my parents, your father, all the families in this neighborhood. If you ask me, your feelings for me right now will fade, just like mine with Blake. I'm sorry for wasting your time. I thought I was special enough for you to take a leap of faith. Now I know how wrong I was. He then left without another word. When Tim closed his blinds, honestly, I felt a sting in my chest. This is for the best, right? I can't deny the uneasiness I felt without Tim. It's not that he didn't want us to make up. I just didn't know how. Seeing how happy and smiley he was with her, my uneasy feeling only grew bigger. Is this what they call love? No, no, no. It's not real. Happy-looking families are not actually happy. And the Cunninghams are just good at faking it. What's that I'm hearing? Are they fighting? I saw the husband suddenly punch the wall with rage, then push the wife. I no longer had eyes on them, but could hear a huge commotion over there. What on earth is going on? Panicked, I called the cops right away. Wait a second. That means their happy marriage really was fake. I excitedly limped across the street to tell Tim about my discovery, then dragged him over to the Cunningham's front lawn. However, when the cops arrived, both of them answered the door perfectly fine. Turns out they already knew about my spying, and were so annoyed by it, they decided to pull a prank on me. Great, my curious neighbors have also witnessed this whole humiliating ordeal. But the worst part was seeing the disappointment on Tim's face. You have to stop being so stubborn. Not every family is like yours. I couldn't say a word, not even when the cops gave me a warning. That night, I tossed and turned as Tim's words wiggled around my mind. Suddenly, something caught my attention. It's from Tim's house. Some flashlights were moving around. I tried calling Tim, but he didn't answer. Of course, he'd be in deep sleep by now. Calling the cops was useless because of that very recent embarrassing incident. That's it. I'm doing it myself. Out there on Tim's front lawn, my heart was beating like crazy. Thieves! Thieves! The startled thieves turned around, so I blared the air horn, then shouted. 
Freeze! Stay where you are! Hands over your heads! But, obviously, I, a teenager with one working leg, never actually expected any criminal to stand still. They quickly got a hold of me, and right when I thought my life was over... Get away from her! Tim! Thank goodness! Other neighbors also came and stopped the thieves. Tim called the cops, and this time, they reported to the scene ASAP. Phew, that was insane. Mrs. Jones, Tim's mom, thanked me and invited me to stay the night. It's really nice of her, even though she burst out laughing when I explained the situation with the Cunninghams. When Tim went to grab some drinks for us, she asked me why I was alone in this condition. So, I spilled everything about my family. Contrary to her reaction just now, she showed me sympathy. From her experience, love didn't always have a happy ending, but it doesn't mean it's not real. Tim's dad and I had genuine feelings for each other. It's just that over time, things changed. We're open to accept this and be honest with each other. That's what real love is. I wouldn't change a thing and I would still fall crazily in love with him, despite knowing we would eventually break up. Because that's how I got Tim, the second real love of my life. Her words hit different. Maybe I'd given love a bad name. You're right, love is not at fault, and Tim is so lucky to have a loving mom like you. Meanwhile, my parents don't just hate each other, they put it all on me too. Bet you, even tonight's incident won't make them care. I see where you're coming from, but why don't you just give it a try? Their reactions might surprise you. So, I called them up, and guess what? They both sounded concerned on the phone and said they'd come home as soon as they could. See, I told you so. It's alright now. Timmy, please show Lex where she'll be sleeping. That was really brave of you. Being all heroic out there despite your whole situation. I wouldn't have risked my life if it wasn't for... If it wasn't for what? I'm all ears. For you. I'm sorry I overreacted. The thought of becoming a boring old couple who hate each other bugged me. But then I realized if we were together, we wouldn't have to be that. We could be like the Cunninghams. That doesn't sound too bad now, does it? I guess not. Next morning, I woke up to my parents' call. They actually kept their promise this time. My mom explained that she thought dad was home to take care of me, while dad absentmindedly assumed mom only left in a fit of anger and was going to return soon. So they really do care about me. They just have a terrible way of showing it. They stayed together, thinking it would be best for me. But the unending tension and bickering was eating us all up from the inside. This incident opened their eyes, so they agreed to have a peaceful divorce while still looking after me together. I'm finally free from the cast, but I actually feel even more liberated than before. Is this the power of my newfound belief in love? Is it because I've realized that love was around me all along? I'm not sure myself, but who cares? Alex and Timothy signing off. Hey, what's the matter with you? Don't think you're better because you help everyone you see. Oh, so now we're being honest? Fine, my turn. I didn't listen to what everyone said about you and still became your friend. Turns out they're all right after all. Like father, like daughter. What are you talking about? You... you... you knew everything? Yeah, I'm not dumb. And that's not all. Now I finally believe my dad died in that fire because of your dad's negligence. His dad... was among the victims in that fire? My feet wouldn't move, and my muscles were constricting from shock for a while before I could drag my heavy heart and crumbled thoughts to somewhere else. I'm sorry about his dad, but I'm in pain too. It's not just because the boy I like was cruel to me, but also because, as it turns out, he's no different from everyone else. Devastated, I unknowingly brought myself to the gymnasium. Wait, my self-defense club? They're still practicing? Wow, hard at work already. Amazing. Shut up! Why are you even here? Then their insurrection began. Just quit already. We're not here to entertain you. Your careless, irresponsible behavior has said enough. You don't even know why we need to learn how to defend ourselves. You never cared about us in the first place. Don't even bother pretending. Leave. Okay, fine. I won't stay where I'm not welcome. Bye, then. Home at last. I was gonna take my frowny face straight to my room, but couldn't hide it from Dad. Sweetie, why the long face? How are you so cheery all the time? Life's beautiful, and we get to see it every day, no? I hate it. I hate to see you get all the blame while doing nothing but good deeds. How everyone's mocking us. But above all, I hate how you always have that happy-go-lucky smile, even though people treat you like the butt of their jokes. I hate trying to be a hero like you said, but I can't stand pretending to be weak either. I hate everything! Honey, they might think the worst of us. 
But that doesn't mean we have to be so pessimistic and indifferent. Then we're no better than them, aren't we? You can't change the way people see you or be anyone but yourself. Perhaps one day we might manifest something good to the universe. But first, we need to be good people. His words actually woke up something in me. Was I wrong about everything all this time? In the following days, Aaron and I ran into each other a couple of times, but we both avoided eye contact. <sighs> that one's a dead end, but a boy is not my biggest problem. Now I want to flip the script and start over. But from where? Ah, oh, I know. But wow, everyone immediately got their torches and pitchforks ready at the sight of me. Good afternoon, y'all. What you said the other day got me thinking, and I'm sorry. I want to help, for real. Of course, only if you want me to. Come on, I'm already at the bottom. Give me a chance to go up, huh? No loss for you anyway. They seem convinced, so I got down to business right away. What? You're already cowering? I only swung my arm. Hmm, looks like what they've been practicing wasn't working. So I decided to put them on a strength-building regimen alongside one-on-one -on -one sessions with me. On top of that, I built each member's profile detailing their weaknesses and how they should be improved. Most of us aren't tall or athletic. How about you show us how to use weapons like pocket knives, nunchucks, and axes? Seriously? <clears throat> Sorry, but swords are only as good as the women who wield them. You'll most likely hurt yourself if you carry those things around. So, I came up with the idea of teaching them self-defense using familiar items like backpacks, pens, and heels. And this look? I actually wanted to get rid of it. But I decided to keep it up since this is what most girls wear. This should show them how to protect themselves in the most unexpected situations. Danger won't wait for you to change into appropriate attire. Besides, I'm totally serving this look. Then more students joined our club. I see geeks, nerds, goth chicks, and even popular cheerleaders. Hmm, what brought them here? Hazel once mentioned that they all had a reason to learn self-defense. So, I decided to sit everyone down one day. All right, no practice today. I want this club to not only empower us girls physically, but also be a safe space to, you know, talk about ourselves and our problems. Okay, who wants to go first? I broke the ice by sharing everything that's wrong with my life, why I had such a slappable face, and all things false about my family that everybody liked to say. The girls seemed quite bewildered, then began contributing to the conversation. Well, for me, it's my mom. She got divorced recently, and now she's doing really questionable midlife crisis stuff. I mean, she can do whatever she wants, but I'm still very angry with how she's handling things. So my therapist said I should take up some physical activity to deal with my anger issue. It seems to work, so far. I feel powerless at home too, so I thought learning how to fight would give me the strength I need to stand up against my stepdad. Yeah, I felt helpless many times before, like whenever I reported my stalker to the police, and they said there's nothing they can do. But practicing with you guys made me feel strong and confident, no matter how brutal it can be. Totally. With what we learned here, I felt like one day we could both reverse stalk our stalkers. Jeez. I only wanted to take advantage of these poor girls at the beginning to get out of trouble and almost abandoned them. What was I thinking? And since then, they'd all got stronger and seemingly more confident through each lesson. Every girl had several bruises, but the brightest smiles were always on their faces. We must have looked like the happiest thugs. One day when I was enjoying my meal, Betty came and said she wanted to have a word with me in private. I put aside our differences, but then she said this. I'll cut to the chase. Your violent little club is getting more popular and taking away people's attention from what's truly important. Me, uh, my campaign. I don't follow. We exist in completely different spaces. I have nothing to do with your campaign. You know what I'm talking about. All that everyone cares about now is your girl fight club. I'm just concerned that you're planting seeds of violence in other students' minds. That's all. Gosh, I don't need to explain to you, of all people, what I'm doing. If you're worried nobody cares about you anymore, maybe, just maybe, they're tired of your sob story and useless anti-bullying measures. Ugh, you're wasting my time. However, I couldn't have anticipated disaster struck right that evening. Another person was complicit that day, but I was hesitant to point her out because I feared her retribution. But now your love and support have given me strength to do the right thing. That girl was none other than Jamie. She even blatantly lied to the principal that she had self-defense club. But they're nothing but a bunch of thugs in disguise. I am truly terrified for myself and everyone else in this school. Members of the club were on my side. Still, most people chose to believe Betty, including the teachers. And so they shut us down. <sighs> Am I on the right track after all, or should I just return to my old, quiet life? The next day, the whole club came to comfort me. Don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. Never mind her. She already had her army of sims go to war with Team Betty. But from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. 
I couldn't have done anything without you guys. It's my fault the club shut down. Jamie, we became fighters thanks to you. You're a real one. I was walking home, feeling much better than yesterday, when I saw the last person I want to see. Betty, who's with her bullies? Betty, you okay? Never better. See, I'm with my friends. What? Didn't these guys beat you up? We buried the hatchet. Friends for life, right guys? You talk too much. What now? What's the problem? Aaron came flying out of nowhere and pulled me out. Then they tried to pick a fight with him, but Betty prevented it. Then we walked together, no word spoken. When a thank you was on the tip of my tongue, he already went in another direction. Later that day, I found out that Betty owed money to them and almost couldn't pay them back. Hence, their intimidation. Now that the issue was settled, they're back to being friends. Their friendship made me cringe. I shouldn't bother myself with it since I already knew Betty wasn't all pure and innocent then. The next morning, Betty dragged me aside as soon as I came to school. Looking for your favorite scapegoat? Where are your bestie assailants? Shockingly, she wanted to apologize. Jimmy, I promise it won't happen again. She even said that it was Aaron who told her to change her ways. Welp, it didn't matter anymore. Pretty please, don't tell anyone about this. My parents would shave all my hair and use my shiny bald head as a mirror if they knew. Whatever, I'm no snitch. But how long do you think you can get away with this? People's sympathy will run out one day. Are you going to ask them for another punch to have another sob story? Then I stormed off, leaving her frozen on the spot. <sighs> It's Monday, meaning I was supposed to attend club meeting. But now that we're banned, I don't have anything better to do. So bored. Suddenly, I saw smoke rising from afar. That direction. It's the gym. I acted on instinct and ran towards it. As I approached the fire, I realized it was much bigger than I thought. Worse, I heard someone scream for help from inside. So I hit the fire alarm. But as soon as it sounded, memories of the fire in the past and my dad came rushing to me. It's keeping my feet rooted there. At this point, many people heard the alarm and came to help extinguish the fire. What you standing there for? Give us a hand. Ayo, did she cause this? Out of the way. Useless. Images of Dad's scarf filled my head. I just want to explode. Is history repeating itself? Are people going to die? Jimmy! 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 I was awoken by the calls of my friends from the club. They're helping too, but this much water and sand couldn't do much to this ever-growing fire. In a split second, I tore out a piece of my shirt, dipped it in some water, then wrapped it around my face before running straight inside the burning building as everyone else gasped at me. The black smoke covered my field of vision. I dashed further inside and showed any survivor I saw the way out. Shockingly, I found Betty, shivering and cowering. I called out her name a couple of times, but no response. Without thinking, I carried her out in my arms. As soon as we got out, I saw Aaron trying to tell me something, but I didn't hear a single word as I was fixated on looking for more survivors in there. Suddenly, fire truck sirens took me out of it and I stopped. Firefighters are here! My dad's here! They swiftly took care of the rest. But my dad's uniform caught on fire, which had to be taken off. That's when he inadvertently revealed his scarred arm. When the fire had been put out and no one was left inside, I rushed over to give my dad the biggest hug. Dad, you're all right. I finally did it. Then some townsfolk came to pick up their kids, and I saw them looking at my dad's scar with this stupid, aghast look on their faces. What are you looking at? You all thought of firefighters' bodies flawless? This? It's what he got for trying to save you and your family in that tragic fire and all these years. He should have been praised as your hero, but instead, all he got in return is deformity and your ungrateful ass. Dad had to hold me back to stop any further colorful words from coming out of my mouth. Poof. They need to hear that. It took a while before a few people approached my dad, asked him how he was doing, and apologized for mistreating him, as well as disregarding his contribution to the town. Hey, my emotional outburst helped. After that incident, I spent a few days at home. The girls told me that Betty admitted to setting the gym on fire so she could play the victim and be the center of attention once again. Betty only contacted Aaron because she wanted him to save her specifically, but the fire was unexpectedly huge and spread like, well, wildfire. Tragically, Aaron didn't make it in time while Betty was completely unaware of other students in the gym at that time and accidentally trapped them. There's going to be dire consequences for her no matter what. That evening, I answered the door to see a familiar face. Hi. Hi. How are you holding up? I was so worried. Wait, let's go somewhere else. I didn't take Betty's text seriously until I heard you running into the fire. Please forgive me. I'm sorry about the last time we spoke. I was so angry I said all those wrong things about you. 
I'm very sorry about your dad as well. It's okay, and my family and I should have been thanking your dad and his team. Without them, my mother wouldn't have been around now. That's alright. I wasn't being completely honest either. The truth is, I... I know. Ever since the day we fell out, I kept an eye on you still. I know that's creepy, but I just wanted to know how you're doing. Believe it or not, I secretly came to your self-defense club a couple times and saw what good deeds you're actually doing. And now, would you give me the chance to get to know the real you? Bro, you're sure you want to know me? I've seen that you're more than willing to ditch me and help just about everyone in need, and I'm tired of that. Besides, aren't you into nice, cute, petite girls? Says who? Is this about what I said in English class? It's just so the girls would stop. And the other thing, guess I was a bit misleading, but that's how I instinctively act to everybody because I thought it's what any good person would do. When you finally become my girlfriend, you'll get the special Aaron Taylor treatment. Ahem, that's still not my biggest achievement this school year. I got to be friends with these amazing people. And even though I'm not a true hero, I found a way to help them overcome some of their problems. Would you believe it? I was really happy I did that. And I was... It's the country's fair day today. Or as I like to call it, my winning day. See that huge plushie over there? It's about to become mine. Ready, set, and... Yes! Bullseye! I excitedly took the bear when it suddenly got yanked away by this crazy bull. Hey, I won that bear fair and square. But I saw it first. Now hand it over, hobbit. Hobbit? I yanked the bear from him, but it ended up ripping in half. His girlfriend burst into tears, and now I'm like a red rag to him. He rushed towards me, and before I could even think straight, my fist took over. How many times have I told you, Angie? A girl doesn't just raise her fist and cause trouble like that. It was self-defense. He was gonna hit me, Mom. I'm done with this. Like father, like daughter. Why are you even bringing him up? He left us years ago, so let him stay out of our lives. Even thinking about him made my blood boil. I turned to the window, avoiding the look I knew my mom was giving me. When we got home, we found the door open. Something wasn't right. I quickly ran into the house and saw black shadows standing in our living room. Who are you people? What are you doing in my house? All hail our new leader! The lights suddenly came back on, and I saw them all bow to... Me? Angelina, I've been looking forward to meeting you. I'm Nick Mason, Mr. Bruno's right-hand man. My dad sent you here? From this day on, you will become our new leader of the ex-organization, on his behalf. You gotta be kidding me! For so many years, he hasn't cared about whether we live or die, and now he suddenly wants me to take over? And look at you all. This organization seems no good. Please don't misunderstand us. X organization was founded by your father to help the local people and fight for justice. But things took a horrible turn, so I'm afraid he's gone to jail for a little while. He's in jail? Oh, my head. Fighting for justice? That's why he's in jail now? Your father put the safety of the seaport local first. In doing so, he fell into the enemy's trap. You will understand him better if you accept his wish and become our leader. As much as I hate to admit it, I missed my dad. He once promised that he would skip his work and hang out with me on my birthday, but then he just disappeared without a word and has been quiet for the past six years. Until now. Darling, I have something for you. She gave me some old letters and a plushie bear, which I'd begged my dad to buy for me. She'd hid it from me the whole time, as she was mad at my dad for always risking his life for things that weren't any of his business. It turned out that my dad had still cared about me, even without me knowing. Mom, I've made up my mind. I hope you'll support me. So, my mom and I had a long journey to the seaport of the city where my dad's ex-organization was secretly operating. We walked into the market, then stopped at a large fish shop. How on earth does an organization have their secret base in such a crowded place? The most dangerous place is the safest one. Remember that. I remembered my dad used to say this to me when I was a kid too. This must be his crazy idea. Nick led me into a room at the back of the store and introduced this as the organization's base. So, this is where my dad used to work, and he'd still kept the same old hat all these years? Let's get to work. There's been a lot of theft going on in town lately. Every night, the thieves break into stores and steal everything they can. People are panicking right now, so we need to solve this as soon as possible. Isn't this the police's responsibility? If they were capable, we wouldn't have to get involved. That's why your father maintains this organization. Now you need to settle in a bit. I've arranged your accommodation and enrolled you in a local school. Remember, your identity is top secret. For the next few days, at 5am every morning, Uncle Nick got me up and took me to the port to tell me more about the thieves. 
However, he just joined the fish auction the whole morning instead of actually doing anything serious. So I went somewhere else and pretended to talk to the fishmongers about the burglaries in town. At that moment, a guy in a cap that covered his face bumped into me. Hey, dude, nice bracelet, but ever taught to apologize? Hey, hey, take it easy. You're making a scene. Okay, maybe I should just behave like a normal schoolgirl here. Having to get up so early in the morning to go to the port also made me too exhausted to study anything. One morning I was falling asleep at my usual place when some noise woke me up. A group of gangsters was teasing a boy? Dude, I'm trying to catch some shut-eye over here. Shut up, loser. Uh-oh, they were messing with the wrong person. I grabbed a nearby mop and made some fancy moves that took them all down, then dragged the flabbergasted nerd out of there. He wasn't calm enough to run for his life. This little guy is Killian. Ever since that day, he kept following me and wouldn't shut up about how strong I was, saying things like, I could never imagine a small person like you having such crazy strength. Or, they all pick on me, but you, Angel, don't. Then, let's be friends. I have no peace when he's around. While I was trying to make some space for myself, a call suddenly came from Uncle Nick. One of the jewelry shops in the city just got burglarized. Can you help? What? Yeah, I'll head back to headquarters and set up a plan. You can count on me. I then hung up, and that's when I heard a ball hitting the floor. I turned around, and there was Killian, standing behind me, shocked to the core. He'd obviously heard the whole conversation. If you utter a word of this to anyone, you'll not wake to see another day. Do you hear me? I... I can help you. I know this town like the back of my hand. Okay, we can be friends. Or associates. As long as you keep quiet. After school, Killian and I rushed to the crime scene. While wandering around, I spotted a shiny thing among the broken glass. It must have been from those thieves. But wait, I've seen this D symbol somewhere. I was about to pick it up when Killian grabbed my hand, shivering. Bro, it's her who attacked us back then. That gangster suddenly came at me. I tried to dodge him, but ended up toppling over backwards. Suddenly, a strong arm held me back and shielded me from the punch. Mamma mia! Who's this handsome hunk? I wrapped my arms around him and pulled out my inner damsel in distress. Oh, my hero! These jerks won't leave me alone! Please save me! I'm scared! Mess with my friend one more time and you're dead meat. Get lost! He turned to me, making sure I was okay, then parted way. Through Killian, I found out his name is Frank, a senior at our school, and he's known for his cold and reserved demeanor. Definitely my type of guy. But wait, what about the bracelet? I returned to the broken glass window. The bracelet was nowhere to be found. At school, all students were constantly talking about these recent burglaries. Everyone was worried about who would be the next victim. When will all this nonsense stop? I wonder who their next target will be. Don't you see? The recent victims were all the big shots in town. And the crimes were all on the days the police weren't out patrolling. So then, Graham's jewelry shop and Holden's boutique store could potentially be their next target? That makes sense! Uh, wait, Frank? Now that you're here, I feel so much safer. It'll probably be Holden's because Graham already added a new security system to his shop. Please stop fiddling with your hair like that. Good observation. The police don't patrol the port tonight, so they might make a move. So stay still inside, will you, sweetie? Aww but his sweetie still got to watch Holden shop and catch the thieves red-handed tonight. An hour had already passed, but nothing had happened. Right at that moment, Nick received a phone call that Graham's shop had just been robbed. The thieves broke the security system and everything had been taken. Nick snapped at me for acting impulsively without having any clear evidence. But this felt so sketchy, though. Holden's store was way more vulnerable. It's like they knew we were waiting to ambush them here. A few days later, while I was patrolling around the shopping street, Killian informed me that there was a suspicious masked man sneaking around the pearl shop. I immediately dashed there, right at the moment he was breaking the lock. In the blink of an eye, I kicked him, knocking him to the ground. Angelina! Holy crickets, are you okay? I looked up to see Frank running towards me. The thief immediately rose up, causing me to fall back, then fled the scene right away. Catch the thief, quick! Frank and Killian darted past me and followed the guy. I waited for them at the harbor, but only Killian came back. Oh, sorry, Angelina, but I have to say this. There's something fishy about Frank. I think he's on the thief's side. 
Oh, come on. Are you jealous of him? How do I know you're not their spy? What do you mean? You've been acting suspicious from the get-go. You wouldn't leave me alone for a sec. And remember how you listened in on my conversation with Nick? And what about when you made me so sure it was Holden Shop that would be the next target, hmm? And now you're blaming Frank? You're so wrapped up in that jerk. I saw him purposefully let that thief go. When I was about to catch up to him, Frank suddenly stopped, making me crash into him. Then the thief got away. That, that can't be. He's always there to help me. I'm the one who's always backing you up, but you only see that fraud as your hero. Ugh, just forget it. Wait, I, I had no idea who to trust. It was all so confusing. Right at that moment, I got a message from Frank asking me to go to this meteor camping place as he had something important to say to me. Okay, it was time to confront him and get the truth. I rushed there as fast as I could, only to find... nobody? I looked around and noticed this suspiciously lit up tent. The tent flap suddenly opened, and a shadow bolted towards me. Hey, hey, calm down, it's me. I opened my eyes to see Frank in front of me. He'd set up this whole place for me? Frank suddenly took my hand and confessed. Angelina, I've fallen head over heels for you. I was wondering, will you be my girlfriend? Together, we could be a power couple. With your ex-organization and my Darkwalkers clan backing us, how do you know I'm related to ex-organization? Ha, <laughs> I've been watching you since that first day you wandered around the fish market with that old Nick. <laughs> Remember this bracelet? You almost got me that time. You, you shameless, rotten, stinking skunk! I even trusted you over Killian! Oh, come on. It's not my fault you fell for me and betrayed your best friend. You and I are more alike than you think. It's only fitting that we become a team. Enough! Listen carefully. I'm never going to team up with a dirtbag like you. H how did you- Guys, take her! From the tents, Frank's minions came out one by one and surrounded me, then gradually tightened the siege. Let's see who's the boss now. Oh, no, 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 I fell into his trap. Those punks held a rope, ready to tie me up. But right at that moment, I heard a car engine approaching. Is that Killian leading Nick and the X organization? He jumped out of the car, ran past the minions and Frank to get to me. Angelina, are you all right? You're not hurt anywhere, are you? I shook my head and felt so touched. He'd come to save me. I thought you were mad at me. I was, a little bit. But I couldn't let you do all this alone, so I went to Uncle Nick. Behind Killian, Uncle Nick and the team had seized all the thieves and their ringleader, Frank. Now they'd spill all their dirty secrets in front of the law. It turns out, my dad was about to expose the Darkwalker clan for their evil antics when they framed him for intentionally causing injury and put him behind bars. Since I became the new leader of X, Frank had been trying to seduce me so he could manipulate the organization. Finally, though, my dad was found innocent and released. Mom and I welcomed him home with open arms. I'm so sorry for leaving you behind. I was afraid I would put you in danger. It's all right, Dad. You must have had a hard time, too. I'm sorry for taking so long to realize how proud I am of you. I missed you so much. Dad was super impressed with what we had accomplished for the organization. He even decided to let me continue to be the leader, all the while supporting me and teaching me his tricks. And I know for sure everything will turn out okay, especially with this guy by my side. So, did I do a good job proving myself, lady boss? The vice leader position seems to suit me well, don't you think? Hmm, you do deserve a promotion. How does vice leader and boyfriend sound? I was skipping to the kitchen to see the apple bag Dad had prepared for my school picnic. Aww, how thoughtful of him. I excitedly took a bite, but it tasted like it had been left to rot for a decade. I frantically checked the bag and saw this was not the only bad one. Dad! Hey, I'm Doris, and things like this are an everyday occurrence for me. My dad's clumsy and colorblind, two contributing factors that sure make life interesting. Since mom passed away, I had to watch him like a hawk, else you betcha he'd mess stuff up. One time he roasted a turkey, but it was so raw as if it would jump off the plate and run around the house. And on my last birthday, he got me a pair of mittens with one bright orange and one neon green. I reluctantly tried them on, looking like a clown while people burst out laughing. Despite all that, he's still an awesome dad in my eyes. A super talented artist with incredible artwork, provided he lets me label the paint colors. 
And also a really big supporter of my dream. From the first time he helped me skate on the lake, I knew it was my life's calling. If I can be an artist, even though I'm colorblind, how can just a few bumps stop you from being a figure skater? Bravo. I'll definitely give him a 100. Except that he does have one bonkers rule. No dating until I'm 18. Whatever. It's not like I gave boys much thought. The only boy I spoke to was my neighbor, Ben. And dad seemed to like him. That kid's pretty good. He likes drawing and artists are caring people. Just like me. <laughs> and he seems to not attract it to girls, either. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but it's true that we can never be a couple. His mushy manner is definitely not my type. Anyway, it's super fun having him as a friend. Since we were little, Ben always went along with anything I asked, from drawing me a unicorn picture from my room, giving me his only ice pop, to more exciting things, such as knocks and runs, and covering the neighbor's car in toilet paper. <laughs> And now, he always escorts me to my skating practice a few towns away, and just sits there scribbling something until I finish. This whole month I've been practicing so hard for the upcoming big competition in town. I'm gonna bring a medal home! This is my time to shine! I started gliding, letting the rhythm control my movement. The cold, calming breeze pushed against me like I was flying. It's time for an axle jump. I sprang into the air like a cotton ball, but suddenly lost my balance and fell flat on my face. As a result, I was ranked 29 out of 30. Duh. But surprisingly, there was one judge giving me all high marks. Finally, someone saw my potential. I was beaming when this cute guy approached me. Hi, I'm Luke. Just wanted to say that you were absolutely on point out there. Oh, he's that guy. I really want to get to know you more. How about we hang out together? I'll take you somewhere as special as you are to me. This is definitely against dad's rule, but oh boy, his killer smile made my stomach swoosh. So I ended up saying yes. I excitedly told Ben, but he gave me this sour face look. Hey, your dad will not be happy if he knows this. Just don't let him know. Luke is an expert, so he can help me hone in on my talent. You will keep this a secret, won't you? So, here's my first date ever! Luke was so sweet. He complimented my ice skating and constantly gave me these loving looks. Our food arrived and delish! Bon appetit. I daintily tried the mashed potato and immediately felt the delicious taste of warm butter and chives and... something... pointy? A hairpin? I quickly stood up, demanding to see the manager, but Luke stopped me. Babe, you found the gift I prepared for you. Then he grabbed the hairpin and wiped it on his shirt and put it on my hair. <laughs> Maybe this was a normal thing for guys to do on dates, right? Only his gifts show didn't stop there. Later I found a ring in my steak, then a keychain in my salad. You're cute, just like this Lotso. Isn't he the bad guy? But the cherries on top were the movie tickets in my sandwich. Luke, what's this about? I just hope we could bond over watching movies together. You hate it that much? No, no, I didn't mean that. Think about it. It was kinda... weird. But also the sweetest thing that had ever happened to me. Luke had a funny way of showing it, but he made me feel special and giddy. And maybe... in love? Before I could think straight, he was leaning closer to me. I closed my eyes and was ready for the most romantic kiss ever. But why were his lips so hard and unmoving? What? The menu? And holding it was... Dad? You know this crazy old man? I am her father. Then Dad dragged an extra chair over to our table, plopped down, and started babbling on. Then, when Luke wasn't looking, Dad poured pepper into his coffee. Before I could say anything, poor Luke took a sip and spat it out everywhere. Mm, sorry. I thought it was sugar. You see, I'm colorblind, so it was an honest mistake. After that, he accidentally splashed the sauce on Luke's shirt, then grabbed his glass of red wine and poured it over Luke, saying he was trying to clean it. Enough! Your old man is insane! No one will ever date you again! Then he stormed away. I was furious! How could Dad embarrass me like this? You're controlling, crazy, and do the stupidest things! You don't allow me to be me, and you just scared away my date! None of his apologies could move me. I had the right to make my own choices without dad interrupting and being ridiculous. So I used my savings and moved out of my home to start my new life. This freedom was greater than great. I could talk to any guy and go on as many dates as I wanted. Only, I know there's always were extra eyes on me. Do you get the feeling someone's watching us? No way, it's just you and me. 
I've had a great time. Do you want to do it again? Ugh! What the fudge? If Dad thinks he can stop me by messing around like this, he's totally wrong. It did quite the opposite instead. I started dating loads of guys, even if I didn't like them that much. It was so nice being spoiled by boys, and my room was always full of their presence. I updated Ben all about my dating stories, but he just frowned. Yo, slow down. You want to speed date the entire town? Man, it's just dating. It's not like I've agreed to be their girlfriend or anything. But you don't even know them, or what their intentions are. My dad doesn't understand me. Why now you sound just like him? Fine, don't feel like you need to come here or give me rides or anything. I can make my own way to school and get my date to come with me to practice from tomorrow. I'm sorry, Doris. Ignore me. I'm probably just overthinking stuff. Yeah, Ben's Ben. <sighs> He's still the one I could count on after all. Anyway, being a serial dater can cause troubles. I muddled up Gregory's interest with Ivan's. And I forgot I already told Anton my hilarious story the third time already. I was late for my date with Hector because my previous shift with Ryan went on longer than I expected. Then being so exhausted from all of this dating, I fell asleep during my meal with Christian. Luckily for me, Ben was always there to help. What's up? You look exhausted. I don't know. Dating was fun at first, but now it left me no time to rest and now I can't even distinguish those guys. <laughs> hey, what's so funny? Nothing. It's just nice not having to share you with an alphabet of guys. Don't worry, you're the only bee in my life. One day after school, a group of boys surrounded me and started accusing me of being a cheater. Hey, it wasn't like I was anyone's girlfriend, so it wasn't classed as cheating. I'm still single, so I can go on many dates as I can. Only, my outburst seemed to make them even angrier, as all these guys shouted at me. A cop walked over. Hang on, is that dad? Hey, hey, you boys stop bothering this young lady right now. I just finished a karate course already. I'll give you a piece of my mind. See? Hiya! Hiya! What a bunch of weirdos. Thank God Dad came here on time to save me. But it's such a shame that he saw I was a helpless failure at everything. So my shame became rage. Who asked you to show up in magazine? Quit bugging me with all your nonsense. I can handle this myself. When I returned to my apartment, Ben was sitting there waiting for me. Overwhelmed with everything, I burst into tears. He pulled me into an embrace and I instantly felt better. But then... Doris, stop with the games and just go home. Games? This isn't a game! This is my life! I deserve to live it how I want to! You're too much of a coward to ever understand that! As soon as I said it, I regretted it. Ben looked so hurt and mad. He just shook his head and left. I honestly thought he was the one person who would never leave. But whatever, I didn't need him, or dad either. Now I had to prove to dad that I was mature enough to handle independence and could find someone much better than Ben beside me. Just wait and see. Told you, now God bless me with this guy, Mark, a super strong and macho BF who was always ready to protect me. Babe, look out. What? Just let me handle this. Then he moved me out of the way and punched right to the wall. Wow, that's a mosquito. Thank you for saving me. One time, we were strolling through the school's garden when I spotted Ben. I immediately gave Mark a cute damsel in distress look and said, Babe, I'm so tired. I think I'm gonna pass out. Don't worry. I'll take you to the hospital. Suddenly, he lifted me over his shoulders and carried me off. My head was spinning and it made me want to faint. Literally. I begged him to put me down and let me sit for a while. Then, I suddenly saw Ben frowning at me. Ha! Huh, seeing me totally fine without him, how can he not be annoyed? But who was that? She started staring at his art passionately. Then, can you believe it? She asked him to draw her, and he agreed! I can't stay here watching this ridiculous play. So I grabbed Mark's hand and pulled him away. But that night, I kept tossing and turning, and the image of Ben and that girl couldn't get out of my head. No, no, no big deal. They were just super irritating, that's all. Too many things happened, and now it's time for me to focus on my figure skating dreams again. With my sugar plum. As he went off to buy us some drinks, who should come over to me but my first date disaster, Luke? Oh, you're still ice skating. Just give up already. I only give you a high score so you date me. Don't flatter yourself. By the way, your crazy old man's still doing good? Shut up. My dad was right about you, you jerk. Jerk? Okay. This jerk will tell the rink manager to ban you from coming here for good. I stared at him, open mouth, not knowing what to say, when out of nowhere Ben appeared. I don't think the skating committee would be impressed by your fake scores, do you? All it would take is one email and you can kiss your position on the judging panel goodbye. How dare you! Then he left in anger. Right at that moment, Mark returned. Babe, skating sucks. Just quit it. Let's go for some trampoline then. Dars, go practice. No one dares to ban you now. Who the freak are you? Mark, stop! That's Ben, my friend. Uh, no, just an acquaintance. 
Doris, watch yourself with that guy. It's none of your business. Let's go, Mark. Bye, loser. The next day at school, I saw Ben with that girl again. My heart thumped in sadness, and I don't even know why. Maybe I was so used to having Ben around me, and honestly, I missed him a lot. Mark soon followed my gaze over to Ben. Isn't that the dude from the ice rink? Why are you gawping at him? He was lunging toward Ben right after. I grabbed his arm trying to stop him, but he pulled me away instead to a corner. You are my girl. Remember that. In front of me was a total stranger. Not the normal Mark I know. He was supposed to protect me, but now all I felt was scared. I couldn't move. Mark leaned over to kiss me, and I immediately blocked him. What? How dare you? Oh no, I'm screwed. Ah, uh, terrorizing your own girlfriend, I see. Nice. Ben? Right on time. You're so done with me. Then Mark grabbed a flower pot and charged at Ben, but I panickedly pushed him over before he could do anything with it. He stumbled about, mumbling something, when Ben's fist came out of nowhere. You, you, you want another punch? Mark waved his fist at him, but then turned around and hurried off. I stared at Ben. I couldn't believe my eyes. He was strong and protective, totally different from the soft Ben I knew all this time. Doris, I think it's time for you to go home. Have you ever wondered why your dad really did that? I, I... Ben was right, and the day's drama made me realize how much I missed Dad. I wonder how he was doing. I arrived back to find Dad sitting all alone, dozing off, amid a pile of mess. He was in stained clothes, and on the easel was an unfinished picture of me. With tear-stained eyes, I ran to him and held him tight. I'm so sorry for leaving. I thought I would be okay by myself, but I'm definitely not. I miss you. You're back. I miss you too, darling. I felt so bad for upsetting Dad. When I calmed down, we talked through our problems. Sweetie, I know. It's just hard. You're all I have left. I just worry you're too young to make the right decision and can't bear seeing these idiots hurt you. But Dad, I need experience to learn and grow too. Support me, will you? Um, of course. I always wish that you can find a kind man who understands, supports you, and is always by your side, and makes you truly happy. All those qualities reminded me of someone. I kept chasing after trivial things out there, thus forgetting the one who was standing by me all the time. So I immediately went to find him. Hey, Ben. Oh, hey. You'll be pleased to know I've moved back in with Dad. Yeah, that is good news. Look, Ben, I'm sorry. I've been an idiot. I took you for granted, and now I feel very bad for this. I, um, was wondering if you'll take me to practice tomorrow? I'll think about it. And I didn't expect to see you confronting a tough guy like Mark. You're not just a timid arty type, are you? Who says I'm timid? I'm only like that when I'm with you because it makes you happy. I'm actually fully capable of looking after myself. And, um, you. I was walking through the forest when a scream startled me. A man running in horror from a pack of wolves! I quickly howled at them, then crouched down. Distracted, the wolves stopped, left the guy, and cautiously sniffed their way over to me! Hey girl! Run away! Shush! After deciding I was no threat, they wagged their tails and started licking my face. Are, aren't you scared? Not at all. People often misunderstand wolves. This isn't Little Red Riding Hood. They're not actually grandma eaters. Come and make new friends, buddy. Hi, my name's Winona, an 18-year-old Native American living on the Blackfeet Reservation with my mom. And I'm about to tell you the craziest story of my life. After the wolves left, I helped the guy find a place to clean his wound and told him more about the wolves. So you're a Blackfoot born and bred? It's my first time meeting a Native American. How about you? What brings you here, city boy? I'm actually a pianist wandering here for inspiration. Have you found it yet? Or did you almost lose yourself just then? <laughs> Inspiration's hard to find, especially when you're a theater pianist. A what? A theater pianist. I work at Winter Garden. In New York? Wow, it's my dream to be a Broadway musical actress. Actually, my theater's looking for a stage crew. You could start from there, and I'll find ways to introduce you to the right people. I couldn't let such a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity slide. But the thing is, my mom absolutely resents theater arts and forbids me to even mention it. So, I gotta devise a plan. I brought Luke home for lunch. Mom was so welcoming and even prepared a great banquet. So, Luke, right? What brings you to Montana? I'm doing a research paper for school. I'm... I'm in college. Oh, so you're around the same age as Winona. She's recently finished high school. I know, and if it wasn't for Winona, I'd be dead by now. So I was thinking, if it's okay with you, I'd like to invite her to college with me. That's nice of you. 
But what are you studying? Uh, hotel management. Mom, I thought I could give it a try too. But honey, you said you wanted to take a gap year. I just didn't want to try college alone. But now I've met Luke, it'll be different. Mrs. Ryder, I promise I'll take good care of her. Mom smiled, then nodded. Yes, mission accomplished. Oh man, look at how crazy the streets of New York are. Thankfully, Luke arranged a small place just a few blocks away from the theater for me. And the following day, he landed me a staff member job to get me used to the theater scene first. It's not easy, especially working for a grumpy director with a zillion demands. Hey, you! Yes, you cleaning lady! Out of the way! But just being here this close to the stage is incredible, right? One day, on set for Mr. Killorn's new play, he started yelling and throwing papers everywhere. Curious, I picked up the script and saw a line written in Blackfoot. Ketsi kakumen? I love you? Mr. Killorn suddenly noticed me. Oops, I must have said it too loud. How did you learn to speak Blackfoot? My mom taught me. Oh, I live in the Blackfeet Reservation. Interesting. You know what? You're cast for the leading role in this play. Go and meet Jade, the coach, here at the theater studio. She'll instruct you further. I froze on the spot and couldn't believe what had just happened until Luke appeared, bowed to the director, and pulled me out of there. Am I finally living my dream now? Here it is, the studio from the business card. Huh? Are they shooing a coyote? This stupid guy was waving his umbrella at the snarling animal. I tried to tell everyone to back up, but no one heard my tiny voice until the guy next to me suddenly spoke up. Everyone, back up! Thank God people finally listened. I slowly advanced to the coyote, knelt, and offered my hand to him. When he seemed to trust me enough, I gently stroked his head and calmed him down. Just then, Mr. Killorn's assistant appeared and took the coyote in. Turned out, he's Mr. Killorn's pet. Who keeps a wild creature as a pet in this stuffy, urban space? You okay? You hurt anywhere? I'm fine. The poor little coyote looked terrified. You know a lot about animals, don't you? I grew up with them, yeah. In Blackfoot mythology, coyotes are guardian spirits. Well, you sure were a guardian spirit right then. I was still so touched by his words, but then Luke suddenly appeared. Winona, I just heard about what happened. You okay? What are you doing here? The guy, who was friendly just a second ago, now seemed cautious and just walked away while Luke glared at him. I'm fine. You should stay away from him. Hmm. Luke doesn't seem to like that guy. Something weird is going on between these two? I went and met Jade, our coach. She told me about the role and introduced me to Nathan, my actor partner, which happened to be the guy I just met. I couldn't help but grin and offered my hand to Nathan, but he just ignored me and turned to the script. Hello? Am I just a stranger danger now? We then tried the opening act, but since it was my first time being on a turntable, I took the wrong step and fell over. Nathan! I was blushing when he suddenly glanced at Luke and dropped me, almost kissing the floor. Right then, a girl barged in. Is everything ready for my set? You're late again, Stella. And actually, you and Winona are both gonna practice and we'll see who's right for the role. Winona who? As if this nobody can stroll in and try to steal my role? How snobby. She's lucky this nobody doesn't want to make a scene on her first day. During the break, I questioned Luke more on Stella. Stella is super talented. She's marvelous at dancing, singing, and acting. No surprise, though, because she's been training since she was little. That's exactly why we should just give her the role already. A waste of time dealing with amateurs. That was so rude. So much for ever thinking he was friendly. In the following weeks, I finally got a better grasp of my character. The female lead was a gentle, down-to-earth Blackfoot woman. Easy peasy. I just need to pretend to be my mom. <laughs> Only, my on-scene love interest Nathan was making things difficult. On stage, he refused to make eye contact with me. But he didn't have this trouble when he was up there with Stella. Every day I had lunch with Luke while Nathan and Stella were giggling in another corner, acting as if they were the most powerful couple here. Are they really... in love? Oh, Winona, please. Why should you care? After lunch, I ignored Stella's glaring eyes and focused on being Nathan's lover on stage. What kind of singing is that? Give me a break already. That's enough, Stella. Actually, I just informed Mr. Killorn over lunch that Winona's getting the role. Ha! Huh, very funny. No, it's not a joke. Look at your performance recently, Stella. It's rather disappointing. Winona, keep up the good work. Stella looked like she'd had the blood sucked out of her. I excitedly beamed at Luke. 
but strangely he looked concerned and ran after Stella. Does he have feelings for her? See that? Why hasn't he just confessed his feelings for Stella already and stopped this unrequited love tragedy? Isn't it because you and Stella are together? And that's also why you're so half-hearted whenever you're on set with me? It's not like that. I just couldn't control myself every time our eyes met. What did he mean by that? Congrats, anyways. I always knew you deserved this role. He's right. I'd really worked super hard for this. I'm so close to achieving my dream now. The next day, I rushed into the first official rehearsal and acted my heart out in front of Mr. Killorn and the whole crew. I was dancing away to Luke's sentimental track when the door slammed open. It was, Mom! I can't believe you lied to me and came here to do these foolish antics! Oh no. Mr. Killorn turned pale while Jade gasped upon seeing Mum. I tried to tell Mum to let me finish this scene, but... Fine! Be this way! Until you come to your senses, you're not my daughter anymore! Mum then stormed out of there. Mr. Killorn told everyone to take a break and also left. I stormed over to Luke and asked if he told my Mum the truth. But right when he was stammering, Mr. Killorn came between us. I didn't know you had to lie to your Mum to get here. Yeah, sadly. She knows about my acting dream, but she has always been so negative about it. Hmm, is that so? Well, you're doing a great job. Continue practicing for the play. And maybe take me to your mom sometime and I'll try and explain this to her. Encouraged by the director's feedback, the next day I confidently acted my part. Yet Jade seemed dissatisfied and criticized my movements, saying they were too rigid. Winona, I'm giving the role to Stella. You need more training. What? I'm not some toy you can throw back and forth. Was it all just a show to get me and her to pit against each other? What was that about? Why the change? You're not qualified. Go back to your mother. What has this to do with my mother? I didn't know what was going on, but I was sure of one thing. I needed to prove myself, so I stayed at the studio practicing, swinging, and swaying my soul away under the studio light until I accidentally sprained my ankle. Right then, Nathan came out and helped me up. Why are you still here? I saw you stay, so I thought I'd stick around for a little longer. As he spoke, he gently pressed an ice bag on my ankle. I felt the butterflies flapping in my stomach, but suddenly remembered his attitude before and pushed him away. Ready to stand up, just to fall into his embrace again. You must think I'm so hot and cold, but I just didn't want Luke to misunderstand anything. What do you mean? We're just friends. And what's up with you and Luke? Then he told me how he and Stella were the best of friends back at acting school until Luke appeared. Luke was instantly attracted to Stella and asked Nathan to set them up. Nathan, of course, happily agreed. However, the next day Stella suddenly expressed her feelings for Nathan right in front of Luke. Luke didn't take it too well and thought I was messing with him. He's resented me ever since. So you and Stella are just friends? We are. Stella might appear childish, but she's good-natured. She's just... She's dealing with a lot inside. I've just been watching over her. But right now, she's gonna have to learn to stand on her own since I think I've met my guardian spirit. His guardian spirit? We were so close, I swear we were almost kissing. But I quickly pulled away, saying I gotta go practice. The final rehearsal is my only chance to get my role back now. I showed up just as a substitute today. But when everybody was ready to rehearse, the only person missing was Stella. No one seemed able to contact her, and the director was growing impatient. Jade had no other choice but to push me onto the stage. Luke didn't seem too happy with this replacement, and suddenly played the piano much faster than expected. Flustered, I took a deep breath and let myself float naturally to his rhythm. During the intermission, I asked Luke what that was about. Drop it, Winona. I already knew. You got in here all thanks to your director, Dad. Yet you fooled me with your little story. It's you who forced Stella away from her chosen role. Who's my dad? Mr. Killorn? Right then I was called for the next act. Still puzzled by what Luke said, I couldn't focus on my part with Nathan. Suddenly I heard Nathan scream my name and leapt to push me to the side. I fell on the floor and saw the massive chandelier land on Nathan. Everybody rushed to check on us and among the crowd came, Mom? We were all waiting for the doctor to check on Nathan when Luke suddenly spoke out. I'm sorry for what I said. But Jade told me Mr. Killorn is your dad, and you guys forced Stella to drop her role. Mr. Killorn and I both gave Mom astounded eyes. Winona's my... my daughter? That's right, Andrew. But don't worry. As soon as Nathan's recovered, I'll bring Winona back home and will not bother you and Jade again. 
No, no, you've got it all wrong. Why didn't you tell me about our daughter? Jade said if I told you, she would harm Winona. Wait, does this have anything to do with the accident? Because right before the act, I saw Jade talking to a crew member who set up the stage for Nathan and Winona. I'll get this looked into at once. So, this play about Andrew and a Blackfoot woman falling in love, is it about you and Mom? Mr. Killorn didn't reply, but looked at Mom tenderly, and she burst out crying. Right then, the doctor came out, saying we could visit Nathan. Luke quickly pulled me aside, leaving the adults there. How are you feeling? Any discomfort? You're not mad at me anymore? Yeah, um, sorry for being a jerk. It's alright, dude. Go find Stella before she leaves. She said she was sick of being thrown around. She's taking a leave to reassess a few things. But why me? Aren't you? We're just friends. How many times do I have to tell you? Luke didn't even wait for Nathan to finish and rushed out of there. I wish them a happy ending. And it's indeed happy endings all round. Not only for Luke and Stella who are now officially an item, but also for Mom and Mr. Killorn. Or should I say, Dad? Our family has finally reunited. On the other hand, Jade vanished as soon as her schemes were out in the open. Turns out, all of this was because she'd been in love with my dad for years. So back when Mom was dating Dad, she told her lies about him to get her to leave. Furious that both Mom and I were back, she decided to make us go for good. Dad helped me get a spot in the Theater Academy in New York, but he misses Mom lots, so always makes excuses to bring me and Nathan back to Montana. You guys need more inspiration, right? New York's just all hustle and bustle. So, how about we move the studio back here? Nathan, what do you think? I don't know, but wherever you are, that's where I'll be. Hey, I'm Esther of the rising TikTok channel at Aesthetic, where I share my passion for fashion. Look at my newest design. Cool, huh? Who would have thought newspaper was a great material for making dresses? I was trying one on and posing for photos when I heard a knock on my door. That's my mom and dad. Esther, we have some good news. We're moving. What? I'm being transferred to another branch in San Francisco. Can you believe we'll be living in that sunny city? No, no, we can't move. I'm, I'm a senior already. All my friends are here. Mom, just get over it and start packing. This is our one chance at a better life. Why can't they understand that I'm not simply shy, but actually have major social anxiety? It's a real thing that I can't just get over. That's also why my 2 million TikTok followers still haven't seen my face yet. I could barely handle the stress from across the screen, never mind being alone in a brand new school full of strangers. Oh gosh, this place must be twice as big as my old school. It's gonna take forever to find the bathroom. Man, it feels like a thousand eyes are on me. Or maybe not, but I can't risk looking around. What if someone makes eye contact? My palms are sweaty, my heartbeat is so loud I can hardly hear anything else. But then, some hot couple walked in and literally ate up the entire hallway's attention. Good, surely no one would notice me now. It was so exhausting running from one class to the next. Now, where do I sit? I walked over to a table, but no one batted an eye. I wasn't sure if I should sit down or not, when suddenly, a pretty girl appeared. Sky blue. Sorry? Anyway, you're new, right? I'm Jojo, class president. Come sit with us. I followed her to another table. Hi guys, got space for two more? Yeah, sure, the more the merrier. Oh no, that girl doesn't sound too happy about having me here. But it would be too awkward to just get up and leave. Uh, hi, I'm Esther. Hey, didn't know they serve fresh tomatoes here. Finish your lunch, Amanda. We have homework to do. Phew, yeah, think about your homework, guys. Don't mind me. I got to know the school layout a bit better, so the next day wasn't as hard. Until I saw some girl waving at me. She looked like Jojo, but her eyes weren't blue. Must be her twin sister or a doppelganger waving at someone behind me. You really just got ghosted in real life? And you call yourself class president? I flinched. So that actually was the class president from yesterday? How strange. Then, my absolute worst nightmare came true in biology class. We had to work in pairs. Okay, which group would like a new member? Anyone? Please, help a girl out. I see you're in a desperate need of a partner, Zeke. Why don't you raise your hand so Esther can see where you are? I saw an arm at the back of the class, so I walked towards it. Hi, newbie. Esther, right? 
My name is Baby Blue Emerald Green? Hey, do my eyes look funny to you, new girl? Jeez, I didn't mean to upset him, so I ended up explaining that I'd had issues with eye contact since I was little, so my mom made me pay attention to strangers' eye colors to make it seem like I looked them in the eye. She even asked me what color their eyes were afterwards to make sure I did what she asked. Well, even though I did, that trick never actually helped me get over my social anxiety. In fact, I usually only notice other people's eye color, not their names or how the rest of their faces look. You're weird, but I believe you. I don't like interacting with other humans either. They tend to pick on me because of my eyes. It shouldn't come as a surprise that us shy kids got along pretty well. Zeke taught me biology and chemistry after class, while I helped him with his Spanish homework. Thanks to him, lunchtime isn't as stressful anymore. We could chat away about anime for hours, and he's supportive of my fashion obsession. So I felt comfortable enough to tell him about my TikTok account. He still liked to tease me from time to time, though. Eye reader, what color are their eyes? You know, the powerhouses, Colin and Amanda over there? No way. I never look pretty guys in the eye, because I'll immediately turn into a walking tomato. Same thing for hot girls. I don't want them to think I'm trying to pick a fight with them or something. You're that avoidant? Have you ever made eye contact with anyone here except me? Yep. Jojo, the blue-eyed girl. Blue? You know her eyes are brown, right? She likes wearing contacts. Jojo changes her eye color, hair, and accessories every week. She's quite a chameleon. Too bad she seems so smitten with that boring guy Colin Gray. Wow, someone clearly has a crush on Jojo. <laughs> but actually, I think Z could be quite a catch too, if he wasn't so insecure about his heterochromia. Speaking of Jojo, have you heard about her Halloween party? What about it? Well, I thought about going, but I've no costume. Forget it. It's not like she'd notice me there anyway. No, you should definitely go. I can help in the costume department. So, here we are. I'd successfully transformed my timid friend into King Lelouch. Who else but Zeke and his unique eye colors could pull this off? As his personal stylist, he insisted I come with him. I'm not even dressed up though. Oh man, I can hear my heart pounding already thinking about how many people will be in there. But I'm not the type to abandon my friend. So, let's go. As soon as everyone saw his majesty, they went silent, then erupted when he flipped his cape. Look at him! <laughs> his ego must be through the roof right now. I then swiftly stepped back to a corner. So, this is what a house party is like. Suddenly, I overheard two girls talking. Aesthetic is definitely from our school, or Zeke had some connections. Yeah, I swear this is the exact same outfit Aesthetic has been prepping on her channel. Oh, come on. There could be hundreds of Lelouch costumes during the spooky season. Girls, please stop speculating. Aesthetic is totally not from this school. I- Hey there, what's your costume? A shy, cute girl? I- I- um, nice Stranger Things shirt. Yeah, I look even better than Eddie, don't I? Um, yeah, totes. So I have this thing. Gotta go, bye! Then they ran straight out of there. That was too much socializing for one day. After that party, I noticed Zeke started to hang out with Jojo and became much more confident. I was happy for him, but he was no longer the same guy. One time, we agreed to study together in the library, but he stood me up. When we met the following day, he said he hadn't touched his homework yet because he was out with Jojo. And then, asked to copy mine. Sure, fine. But when he was done, he flat out refused to teach me chemistry, as he was too busy. Things were that way for a while, until today when I found out the shocking truth. Esther, I only keep her around to do my Spanish homework. You know she's a total buzzkill. Excuse me? Your free homework trial has expired. So much for we're friends, huh? Everyone, look! Someone finally came to some self-realization. How adorable! <laughs> Tell them, Zeke! Did you know she has to make her own clothes? Pathetic! Who was this guy? He's the total opposite of the boy I'd got to know over the past couple of months. Am I in the upside down? It's over. Zeke and I were practically strangers now. Back to my gloomy and lonely life. Annoyingly, I saw Zeke again that day, this time on the school paper. This smug jerk gave an interview on the now-famous Lelouch look. However, in that article, Jojo claimed to be aesthetic, the creator behind that costume, while Zeke backed up her entire story. What in the world? And Jojo even showed some of the sketches that I shared on my account. I was furious and went to confront Jojo, but somehow she didn't seem to be faced at all. <laughs> So what if you're the real aesthetic? I can be her too, don't you think? If you have a problem with that, then let's go sort it out. 
Attention everyone! This is Esther. You probably don't know her, but who cares? She has something to share. The floor is yours, girl. Everyone's gaze turned towards me. Holy moly, where should I look? Why is this so different from talking to the camera? My entire body went into crisis mode. God no, something's coming up. Run! Although I calmed myself down, I couldn't face anyone right now. This is the worst day of my life. Suddenly, someone tapped my shoulder. Amanda? What does this social butterfly want? Did she just ask me if I was okay? Okay? No, I'm not okay. Why is it that girls like you and Jojo, who already have everything, always want to take away everything? Hey, I'm just trying to be nice here. If it wasn't for my silly little friend... What? What are you talking about? Never mind. Sorry, but you don't seem okay. Come with me. I think I know how to make you feel better. Come on, skipping one class won't kill you, but bad mental health will. I wiped away my tears and went with Amanda, even though I barely knew her. But she had a point. The last thing I need right now is a stuffy classroom. Here it is. Go inside. There'll be someone who can help you. That's weird, but alright. I stepped inside, and it was like being hugged with the smells of wood and paper. It felt healing, for sure. I was browsing through the store, then saw Colin walk over. Startled, I stuck my face into an empty slot on a bookshelf to avoid him, but... <coughs> this place is filled with dust! Surprisingly, Colin only smiled and gently wiped the dust off my face. Um, if you're looking for your girlfriend, Amanda just left. She's not my girlfriend. And actually, I asked her to bring you here. Wh what Why? Just calm down. I got you something. How do you know my favorite genre? Because I've seen you read to calm yourself down before. Turns out, Colin had been observing me from a distance for some time, so he even remembered what I usually read. He was hesitant to talk to me though, afraid that all the unwanted attention he might attract would make me feel uncomfortable. But now, everyone knows I like you. Sorry about that. Don't be. It's my fault and my anxieties. I can help you with that. Esther, would you go to prom with me? How will that help? It will. Trust me. Oh, his eyes are... gray? I realized I've been talking to him all this time just fine without using the old trick. What if this guy really could help me? On prom night, Colin drove me there. While he was parking his car, I waited in front of the venue. Out of nowhere, Zeke approached me. Listen, there's not much time. You gotta listen to me. Jojo plans to give you an award, but it's only to get you to stand on the X mark on the stage where the trap door is. She wants to humiliate you in front of the entire school because you're with the guy she likes. So be careful. What game are you trying to play here? Why are you telling me this? I want to make things right. Jojo took advantage of my feelings for her, and I was too blind to see that she only liked Colin, and she's been using me to hurt you. This is my chance to make it up to you, so please, don't go up there. It's a trap. Stop it already. I won't let you make a fool of me again. Right on time, Colin came to the rescue. Haven't you done enough? Stay away from her. I'm truly sorry, Esther. Inside, we were greeted by Amanda. Congrats, bro. I'm finally free from the Collins Rumor Girlfriend label. Jojo must be green with envy seeing how cute you two are together. Right. She's here, as well as hundreds of other people. Nope, I can't do this. I quickly crawled under a table and curled up into a ball. Still, Colin remained patient. You are absolutely stunning tonight. Honestly, your dress is amazing. Come out. Let the whole world see you. The world will only laugh in my face. Okay, then let me join you. It's actually quite cozy down here. What are you doing? Well, tonight is a special night, and my date's a special girl. So I figured we could totally enjoy it in an unusual way. I feel like my insides just turned into a hot, liquidy mess. Who would have thought that I could meet someone who goes out of their way to make me happy? We chatted for a while, then noticed that the lights outside were dimmed for the slow dance. Let's go. Hand in hand, Colin and I swayed to the melody, feeling like we were the only people in the room. Then, the music suddenly stopped. They were about to present tonight's awards for remarkable students. And now, best dressed of the night award goes to Esther Crawford! No way! What Zeke said immediately came to my mind. I turned around to see Zeke looking concerned and shaking his head. Maybe he'd been telling the truth after all. You don't have to go up there if you don't feel like it. Colin was as understanding as always. But then I saw Jojo's smug face. 
I couldn't let her win again, so I mustered all my courage and stepped onto the stage, but steered clear of the X mark Zeke mentioned. Thank you, everybody, but I believe another person deserves this award much more than me. She's none other than our hard-working class president, Jojo. That's so sweet of you, but it's yours. Please, step up to receive it. You mean here? No, one step forward. Here? Jojo became impatient and rushed towards me. No, you have to stand here! Right back at you, Jojo. Have a taste of your own medicine. Now that's some headline material for the school paper. <laughs> so, today is the day. My long overdue face reveal. This is such a beautiful dress, right guys? If you're wondering who this strange girl is, Hi, I'm Esther, and I'm the person behind At Aesthetic. This dress right here, it's what I wore to senior prom. Settle in, I'm doing a face reveal and story time video. Here I am at a press conference, standing in front of countless reporters. Oh no no, that's not me. There you go. I'm Alexia, 17 years old. I may look like a high schooler, but unlike kids my age, I'm a bodyguard. How so? Well, I was adopted by an underground security organization after being abandoned at a young age. Thankfully, Papa, my savior, was around to teach me everything from math to martial arts. Honestly, it was the happiest time of my life. But he'd gone too soon due to cancer, and it's like I was abandoned again. Didn't leave me any time to grieve, the organization put me on training from dusk till dawn, saying I needed to make my papa proud. So I always tried my best and stayed on top at martial arts. However, due to my clumsiness, I ended up as just a bodyguard for VIPs with a codename 036. How boring. <sighs> Until one day, I was summoned by the boss. 036, we have a special task for you. His name is David Smith, principal of Woodford High School. Another doll escort, again. Ugh. You will investigate Mr. Smith for a financial regulation violation by disguising as a new student at Woodford and collect everything related to him, his wife, and daughter. So be extremely careful, is that clear? Yes, sir. Finally, goodbye boring bodyguard job. Time to prove myself. I'll make Papa proud. And to be honest, I'm also excited to experience the life of a high schooler. Now, I needed to do some shopping. Since I only have suits to wear on duty, I didn't know how to dress like a real student. Oh, wow. Look at all these dazzling clothes. After a lot of contemplating, I decided to take this pretty dress. This thing, and also these. They're matching, right? But the saleswoman asked me if they were for my little sister. Huh? What did she mean? Then she picked out something else for me. I was about to try it on when a scream startled me. Help! Thief! Help! Ugh, not a single day went by without trouble. I bolted in that direction and... Aha! Not today, thief! Are you crazy? I'm not the thief. Let me go. Just then, I heard a thud and saw another man in blue being tackled to the ground by two security guards, while a woman snatched the bag out of his hands. Oops, I just caught the wrong guy. I immediately released him. Turned out he was chasing the thief too, but no matter how much I apologized, he kept rambling that I was a violent lunatic and even suspected me of being an accomplice. This guy was unbelievable. He better wish he'd never see me again. Else the next kick won't be a mistake. Today is my first day at school. My disguise was so good, even I couldn't recognize myself. There's no way I'd get caught. From now on, I'll go by the name Alexia. Much better than 036, isn't it? Wait, I know her. Bella Smith, one of my objects. <laughs> wow, the audacity of those girls to pick on their own principal's daughter. Alright, Alexia's coming to your rescue. But not in my normal way. So, here comes a clumsy nerd who accidentally bumped into them, spilling coffee over them, buying time for the prey to run away. The mean girls let out horrified yelps, then yelled at me before running to the restroom. <laughs> then, I turned to see Bella talking to a boy. Oh no, it wasn't just any boy, it was that obnoxious jerk from the mall. What are the odds? Then, they headed toward me. While Bella kept thanking me, I caught a staring look from this guy. You seem familiar. Have we met before? No, nope. no way. How's that possible? It's my first day here. Phew, he seemed not to recognize me. So, he's Clark, Bella's best friend. Now, how am I supposed to approach her when her company was this guy? <sighs> 
Anyways, my first class is about to start. Now, excuse me. I have this perfect cover of a schoolgirl that I need to keep up. Newbie, tell me, where was the American Declaration of Independence signed? Um, at the bottom of the paper, madam? The whole class burst into laughter. How embarrassing. But how was I supposed to know? Papa didn't teach me this. Then suddenly, I heard this alarming sound. Don't panic. I'll handle this. Follow me to the hallway. But no one did. Instead, they laughed even louder. I was still dumbfounded when a nice girl told me it's just an end-of-class bell. Oh, that's what it was. Finally, a break from all those exhausting lessons. Now let's check if the food is safe. Okay, pass. I was about to eat the carrot. Then the mean girls from earlier appeared. Yes, eat it. That'll help your poor eyesight. And this is for staining my dress. Then they strutted off. Ugh. In other places, those folks would have known the taste of my fist. Hey, Alexia. Alexia. So noisy. This place is like a beehive. Alexia. Oh, wait. That's my new name. I turned around to see Bella. She wanted to join me for lunch. Here comes the chance. But nope. The tag-along Clark is also here. Jeez. Ugh. <sighs> I asked Bella why those mean girls teased her, the principal's daughter, but she just shook her head unknowingly. Hmm, but I think I've kind of figured out the reason after talking with her. I noticed that she was a bit slower than her peers, as when I cracked a joke, it took her a while to understand and laugh along. So, prying out information from her should be easy. If only... You've just moved here. How do you know she's the principal's daughter? Uh, uh, I heard from others. This party pooper. Jeez. <sighs> the first week didn't go too well as I was still getting used to being called Alexia and not inspecting my own locker. Also, this load of homework? In general, I enjoy learning stuff at school, but the mission hasn't progressed one bit. I had to pick up the pace, so using the voice changer, I tricked Mr. Smith to leave his office, then sneaked in there. But suddenly, Bella came in. Panicking, I blurted out I was cleaning the desk for the principal. She seemed convinced and even joined me. Another time, I saw the principal talking to someone in the hallway and was about to take pictures with my spy camera pen when Clark appeared and bombarded me with stupid questions. Jesus Christ, if things carried on like this, when on earth would I finish my mission? One day, I spotted Bella in trouble with the mean girls again. Ugh, do these brats ever learn? This is too much. I need to settle this once and for all. So I ran over and quickly pulled Bella away, telling her to run. Then, I threw my famous flying kicks, along with some front sweeps, and got all the meanies knocked on the ground in a blink. Justice served. <laughs> I dusted my hands together in triumph, but has Clark just witnessed everything? This guy was way too suspicious. He probably would ruin my secret mission someday. I need to look into this guy. And it didn't take long for me to find out he wasn't from a wealthy family like most of the other students. He got into this prestigious school on a scholarship for being brainy. Now here I was in Clark's family's bakery. Oh, this girl has his eyes and hair color. We talked and immediately clicked. She was Enola, Clark's sister. She has Down syndrome, but she's a real talent. Look, aren't her designs stunning? I was flipping through Enola's sketchbook when Clark suddenly showed up and dragged me outside. Why did you follow me here? I know you're up to something. Who is the suspicious one here? It's you who always coincidentally appears wherever I am. I only followed you here because you've been stalking me and looking shady. That got Clark speechless. Then his sister came to us saying, Uh, Alexia, Enola really likes playing with you. Rather, let her come inside. His attitude completely changed hearing that. He gently told me that other people often tease Enola because of her condition. He also apologized for misunderstanding me and offered me a free cinnamon swirl. Wasn't this the first time I'd seen him smile? I'd never been so close to him like this. And suddenly, I felt something turning in my stomach. Perhaps I'd eaten too much. <laughs> After that, our conflict was naturally settled. Me and Clark became closer and I got to know other aspects of him. He was really gentle and helpful. The more we talked, the more flutters I felt. Oh no, what's wrong with me? Worse still, I even started to feel uncomfortable when Bella was close to Clark. He always helps her with the smallest things, like opening the door, 
holding an umbrella for her, and even opening water bottles. She always overacted as if she wanted Clark to protect her all the time. No, get yourself together, Alexia. No, 036, you have a mission to do. So, I faked having period cramps to get out of P.E. and sneak into Mr. Smith's office again. I rummage through the trash can, but there's nothing useful. Then, I noticed a locked drawer. And guess what? There was a notepad and an envelope full of money. Then, by shading the paper with a pencil, the letters gradually appeared. It's an address and a time. So, the principal's going to make a transaction there? Got it. Then, on the way out, I clumsily knocked over a pile of documents on his desk. Wait, there was a picture of a woman holding two babies with scribbles. I'll love you three forever. But Bella told me she was an only child. Then, who's this? And here's that place. The middle of nowhere. Exactly where something fishy would happen. 429. It's almost time. Someone's coming. Wait, it's the woman in that picture! She's older, but it's definitely her. And then Principal Smith appeared. They seemed really close. They'd been talking and he handed her an envelope. That envelope? So she was his. What now? Haven't given up on stalking others. Okay, listen carefully. I think Principal Smith is involved in a financial violation case. But not just that. I just got him two-timing. See? N no way. That's my... Okay, I will keep this secret for you on one condition. Let me join this investigation. The principal has been supportive of my scholarship. I don't think he's that type of person. What? He wanted to work with me? That sounded risky, but as long as I kept my mouth shut about the organization, I could spend some Bella free time with him. Good, right? A few days later, Clark told me to meet him at a cafe to discuss the investigation. But it's been ages and he still hasn't shown up. Then out of nowhere, a beautiful cake was presented in front of my eyes. Oh my, it's Clark, singing happy birthday and even gave me a present. Birthday? I myself didn't know when my birthday was. Why, he... And the cake, did he make it himself for me? Aw, he's so sweet. I got so emotional that I almost blurted out my feelings to him. But right at that moment, Bella, out of the blue, jumped in between us. Typical Bella, never leave us alone. Turns out, she was actually the one to insist her dad let her see my student records and make my first birthday cake ever. Thank you guys, I've never had a birthday before because I have no, uh, no, because my parents are always away. Then we should celebrate properly at your house, how about that? What? Why did he suggest that? But then Clark winked at me. Huh, seems like we had a plan. Arriving at her home, we were warmly greeted by Bella's parents. It was such a delicious home-cooked meal. So this was what it was like to have a family. Bella had this all the time? But poor her. She didn't know about her father's a cheater. <sighs> we were in the middle of dinner when Clark asked Mr. Smith about a science project he was doing. Then Clark winked at me again. That's my cue. So I excused myself to use the restroom, then sneaked into Mr. Smith's office. This pen was magical. Let's see what Bella's dear father was hiding. Oh, he withdrew the same amount of money each month. Yay! Today was a success! Thanks to Clark's clever plan, I'd finally got something useful. Suddenly, our eyes met and he looked at me gently while leaning closer. I was ready for a kid when my boss called me. I did not assign this mission for you to play house with that criminal. You have three days. Or else, I'll have someone more capable taking care of this. Such a waste of your papa's expectation. Am I really that useless? Thinking I'd let papa down, I couldn't help but burst into tears. What happened? Who's that? Tell me. I'll handle him. Clark, it may sound weird, but I'm actually a spy. Uh, what? Clark was shocked, obviously, so we sat down on a bench and I blurted out everything to him. Clark didn't say a word and just gently held me in his arms, which made me feel so relieved. You may wonder why Bella and I were in this deserted place. The thing is, a few days after that call, my boss ordered me to bring Bella here to kidnap her and use the documents I gathered to blackmail the principal into resigning. I guess that could help me get rid of the third wheel Bella and have Clark all to myself, right? Oh, isn't that our school's vice president? So he was behind everything after all. Then suddenly, freeze, hands in the air.
Oh my god, the police? Why were they here? Along with Mr. Smith and Clark? We're so doomed! Except, it was my master plan. After receiving the text from my boss, I almost followed his order. But then, I remembered Papa's words. He always told me to never lose my moral compass, and never harm others to achieve personal goals. Bella was a good person and shouldn't be punished for whatever her father did. I couldn't betray my first friend like that. So I told Clark and we set up a plan to find out who was behind all this. And here we are. The vice principal was revealed to have hired my organization to spy on the principal to overthrow him. And when he couldn't find any dirt on Mr. Smith, he turned to use Bella as a leverage against her father. How despicable. Also, I can't believe that the new boss led our organization down an evil path like that. But it's not the only truth revealed. But Principal Smith, how do you explain your monthly money withdrawal? I had a close friend who unfortunately passed away at a young age. He asked me to send his money to his illegitimate son and daughter, whom he'd kept a secret due to family pressure. So there's nothing more going on between you and my mom, right? Huh? What did his mother have to do with this? Turns out the woman he met up with the other day was Clark's mom. That means Clark and Enola were the kids in the picture? What a twist! In that case, thank you for taking care of my family all this time. How foolish of me to suspect you and mom, and even investigate you. My apologies. You… you investigated him before? Yes. Actually, it's not a coincidence that I caught you spying on him. Sorry for keeping secrets, but I knew with your impulsive nature, you'd jump to conclusions and approach my mom. Huh? Impulsive? That's how he saw me? Then he knew me pretty well. <laughs> Why is everything so confusing? Can you explain it to me? Did you befriend me just to investigate my dad? Bella, I'm so sorry for how things went down, but please believe me, our friendship is real. Fortunately, Bella was understanding, and we remained good friends. Oh, actually, good sisters, because the principal adopted me after I left the organization. <laughs> and I still visit the bakery often to hang out with Enola. Enola is so lucky to have a brother who takes care of her. I wish I could have one. No, sorry, I can't do that. Why? Because I'll take care of you in a different way. Hmm. I wonder what's taking Valerie so long. She's been in that changing room for ages. Valerie? Is everything okay in there? Don't force it if it doesn't fit. No, this is the last dress in store. I just need to breathe in for a bit longer. So? It's beautiful, isn't it? Valerie spun around. Then suddenly... Yep. Trying to squeeze into a dress two sizes too small for her, then it split. <sighs> the giggles around us started. Valerie blushed, hurriedly paid for the dress, and pulled me out of the shop. Why am I so fat? Ugh! I just want to feel pretty on my date. If I was skinny like you, I wouldn't have this problem. Poof! You know, it's not as easy as you think being thin. Yep, you heard me right. Being thin has its downsides. First of all, fashion. My nightmare! I have to wear an extra small size, and the clothes still hang off me. Actually, most of my clothes are from kids' stores so I feel so untrendy. Then in winter, I have to wear tons of layers just so I don't freeze to death. And in the summer, <sighs> I can't wear cute clothes as I look like a coat hanger. Not only that, because I'm so skinny, people often ask me to do nonsense stuff. Once, I was studying in my room when suddenly I heard my sister Camilla calling me. She'd forgotten her keys and forced me to climb through her tiny window gap to get them. Seriously, I can't even. Then, on another occasion, Valerie made me crawl into the classroom locker to help her cheat on her Spanish test. Unfortunately, the teacher walked in while this was happening and gave me a week's worth of detentions, of course. Ugh. Oh my god, No Way Home is so good. I literally can't think of one bad thing to say about it. Yep, the part near the end? Ah! Yep, guess what? I'd managed to trap my foot in a manhole. Man, 
What rotten luck! I tried pulling my leg free, but it was no use. It wouldn't budge. There I was, freaking out that I'd be stuck here forever, and all my friends could do was huddle together and ask me questions like, Madeline, how on earth did you get your foot in such a small slot? Wow, that's unbelievable. Even Jaden, my bookworm friend, took out a ruler from his backpack and started measuring how wide the slot was. Grrr. My dear friends, I'm being stuck down here. Stop gawping and help me! Finally, they tried helping me out, but in the end, we had to call the rescue squad. By this point, a massive crowd had gathered around me, and strangers were filming me. When I was finally free, everyone looked at me and held back their laughter. Even Parker, my crush, was smiling. Jeez, this was beyond embarrassing. But a hot guy like Parker would never notice a moving skeleton like me anyway. <sighs> Don't think like that, Maddie. You're so pretty. Show me some confidence, would you? Valerie said as she nudged my arm. I put the book down and glared at her, and suddenly noticed Parker walking towards our table, smiling. And, yep, he said he wanted to sit with us. Even though I was cheering inside of my head, I still had to act composed. And, oh my god, can you believe he even said I was cute? After that day, Valerie kept on encouraging me, saying he had definitely given me a green light. So, finally, I gathered my courage to write down all my feelings for Parker on a note and clipped it to his notebook. At the end of class that day, he came to my desk and took my hand. Yay! Everything was fine, great even, until one day when the two of us were taking a romantic walk past the Swan Lake, Parker suddenly turned to me and said, You're so beautiful, Maddie. And if you just put on a few more pounds, I swear you'll be the hottest girl at school. Yes, I know, but it's hard for me to gain weight. No big deal. Just leave it to me. I'll fatten you up. I thought Parker was just joking, but it turns out he was being deadly serious. Since that day, every time we went on a date, instead of taking me to the bowling alley and movies as usual, Parker would take me out to eat. I swear, I've tried all the restaurants in our town. More surprisingly, on my birthday, Parker even gave me a bouquet of fried chicken. How romantic! But this didn't change anything, as my weight still stayed the same. Parker was disappointed when he peered over me and saw the scales hadn't budged. Then he sighed out. How come you and Valerie are friends, but look totally opposite? Here comes our adorable chubby Valerie. What? Parker called Valerie adorable again. This wasn't the first time either. Annoyed, I put down my fork and walked away from them. After that, I started avoiding Valerie. I did homework with other friends, sat with other girls at lunch, and every time I happened to see Valerie, I turned around and walked away. Honestly, I didn't want it to be this way, but just seeing her made me uncomfortable. But I couldn't bear to see my boyfriend call my BFF cute while he thought I was too skinny. <sighs> then summer break finally rolled around. I thought it'd be just me and Parker, but then he went off to a summer camp in Spain. <sighs> the plan was all ruined. So, I spent a whole sunny day inside sulking. What's wrong? Are you bored because your lover is away? So why don't you take this time to surprise him when he returns? Surprise? A great idea popped into my head. But, but how do I get chubby? Easy peasy. Okay, if it's that easy, then show me. Okay, if you do my summer homework for me. What? She's such an opportunist. But I really wanted to pile on the pounds and please Parker. So, without hesitation, I nodded in agreement. So, from that day on, I started following Camilla's weight gain plan. I switched veggies for greasy foods, and my main meal was always late at night. 
I also changed water for milkshakes, but I did have to stop drinking them when the smell of milk alone made me feel sick. Seeing me eating crazy like that, my parents worriedly said, Madeline, eating healthily is important, else your health will be affected. But I ignored their advice. This time, I definitely had to gain weight. Finally, after a month of trying, I gained some weight. Yay! I looked a lot more attractive now, didn't I? I was studying myself in the mirror when I heard my phone beep. It was Parker. He was coming over tomorrow with a present for me. The next day, I put on this hot dress that I'd never felt confident enough to wear before, and I asked Camilla to help me do my makeup. As soon as I finished, I eagerly waited for Parker in the living room. The doorbell rang. I excitedly opened the door. But as soon as he saw me, Parker quickly said, Oh, sorry. I have the wrong house. Then he started to leave. Huh? He didn't recognize me? This will be fun. No, honey, you're not mistaken. It's me. Your destiny. Madeline? Is that really you? Oh my, how on earth can you be this big? We've only been apart for a month. So, you don't think I'm prettier now? To my surprise, Parker shook his head. No, no, you're so fat now. It doesn't look okay. Lose some weight. Huh? This was so confusing. I thought he wanted me to be bigger. As annoying as this was, I still listened to Parker and tried to lose the weight I'd put on. <sighs> so, it turns out that losing weight is far trickier than it sounds. Actually, it's a million times harder to lose it than it is to gain it. After a month of healthy eating and exercise, I gained another pound. Ugh! Stop eating that. Are you giving up already? You must try harder. What? It's just some popcorn. Why does he have to be so rude about this? I'll give you two weeks to lose weight. Else we're done. Huh? What did he just say? Done? He was the one who wanted me to gain weight in the first place. Now he was threatening to break up with me if I didn't lose it. How ridiculous. You know what? I don't need two weeks. Let's end it right now. It's clear you never loved me at all. You only like my appearance. If you truly cared about me, you wouldn't care what size I was. Then I walked off. Ugh, how could I have been so stupid? For the entirety of my relationship with that jerk Parker, I was blindly following him. I only cared about pleasing him, and it cost me so many things, including my best friend. I needed to apologize to her right away. I nervously knocked on the door, then waited. Finally, Valerie opened it. But on seeing me, she went to shut it. I'm so sorry. Just let me explain, please. Valerie, I'm so sorry. It was all because I was afraid Parker would leave me for you. But I realize now that he's a massive jerk and I was an idiot for ever trying to change for him. Jeez, you're crazy. Parker is totally not my type. I scratched my head and told her about how terrible Parker had treated me and how I'd foolishly listened to him. Man, that douchebag! Then she hugged me. Valerie confessed to me that she'd been trying to lose weight by lowering her calorie intake, but the pounds were coming off. And worse still... She felt weak and tired all the time. I nodded in agreement with her. So, from then on, Valerie and I made a promise to love ourselves, regardless of what size we were, and to never let anyone try and change us. And look, that's Walker and Joel, our awesome boyfriends who love us just the way we are. And you know what? It feels so good not caring what other people think. So, don't ever let idiots put you down. Because when you allow yourself to just be you, then you can finally realize just how beautiful you truly are. Ah, now what better way is there to spend a Saturday afternoon than lying on the couch watching a feel-good movie with lots of snacks?
Ugh, I suppose I better get that. O-M-G, who is this? He's the most gorgeous boy I've ever seen in my life. I stared at him in open-mouthed amazement, but then I saw him gazing back at me and realized I needed to say something. Hey, how may I help you? Hi, I'm Jaden. My mom and I have just moved in next door. Oh, in that case, welcome to the neighborhood. Jaden smiled as he held a box out to me. W- was this a g- gift for me? Already? I took it from him and blushed out a thanks. I opened the box and saw that it was full of delicious-looking cookies. My mom baked them. She finds that people tend to be far more welcoming when it involves cookies. We chatted for a bit longer. Then he said he had to go and help his mom unpack. Aw, why did this moment have to end already? The next day at school, I couldn't wait to find my bestie Stella and tell her about my drop-dead gorgeous neighbor. But as it happens, she found me at my locker and immediately started gushing about this hot new boy. Hmm, I needed to see how handsome this guy was. My chance came at lunchtime when Stella pointed over at the new boy who was currently being pestered by Anna, this stuck-up girl from class. I squinted my eyes. O-M-G. The hot new boy was none other than Jaden. I watched on as Anna fluttered her eyelashes at him, then flicked her hair behind her back. Ugh. She needed to give the flirting a break. It was so tragic. Suddenly, Jaden saw me, smiled, then hurried over to me. Hi, Laura. Oh boy, am I glad to see you. He leaned in close to my ear and whispered, That girl is kind of freaking me out. Please, can we get out of here? Then to my surprise, he took my hand and led me away. I could see the shocked look on Anna's face, and I couldn't help but smirk back at her. Ha! Take that, Anna! He's holding my hand, not yours. Then after school, Jaden and I walked home together. Turns out, as well as being the hottest guy on the planet, he was also really sweet and funny. <sighs> Back home, I saw Jaden's mom, Cynthia, watering her window box. On seeing us, she waved us over, then insisted on inviting me inside for homemade lemonade. We all got on so well. Looks like I'm going to have a boyfriend soon. One whose mom loves me. <laughs> From then onward, Jaden and I hung out lots. We had lunch together, we went to the library together, and always walked home together. I was pretty sure the girls at school were super jealous, especially Anna. One day, during P.E., the teacher told us we were playing dodgeball and assorted us into two teams. Anna, who was on the opposite side, wouldn't quit aiming at me. I tried my best to dodge her throws, but... Bang! She got me! Now, listen to me. Guys like Jaden don't like ordinary girls like you. He's mine. So quit chasing him. Furious, I yelled. I'm not chasing him. He's already my boyfriend. Um, actually not. Yet, I was pretty sure Jaden liked me too. Just you wait. He'll soon tire of you and come running to me. Ugh. Anna was so annoying. I needed to get my frustrations off my chest, so I ranted to Stella about her. Forget Anna. No one likes her anyway. As for Jaden, it's obvious he likes you. He's just new here and probably feels too shy to ask you out. Yeah, you're probably right. He must just be shy. But, ugh, I know Anna won't quit chasing him then you should make your relationship with Jaden official. Stella had a point. If Jaden was too shy to ask me out, then maybe I should take the initiative. Then Anna would have no choice but to back off. Ha! Huh. Tonight was the night. So I texted Jaden, I need your help with something. Let's meet at 8 p.m. by the slide in the park. But then he messaged back saying he couldn't meet tonight as he had to help his mom with something. Right that moment, my dad arrived home earlier than usual and announced that he was taking me and my sister Megan out for dinner. Ooh, this restaurant looked nice. 
I walked in alongside Megan and... Huh? What were Jaden and his mom doing here? Then my dad walked over to Cynthia, kissed her on the cheek, and said, Hello, honey. Jaden and I shared astonished looks. Then we peered at the adults for an explanation. Laura? Megan? This is Ms. Green, the lady I told you about. What? I mean, I knew Dad was dating a woman named Ms. Green, but I had no idea she was Jaden's mom. Then, before we knew what was happening, Dad got down on one knee and pulled out this diamond ring and asked her to marry him. And you know what? She said yes! Oh, no. No, 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 no! They can't marry! Because then Jaden will be my brother! Megan looked delighted and hugged them both, while I stared at Jaden in bewilderment. Don't get me wrong, I really want my dad to be happy, but why her? And what about me and Jaden? After that, Cynthia seemed to always be at our house, baking cakes, humming while she dusted and cleaned up, and exchanging gooey looks with my dad. Ew! Then one day, she insisted that Megan and I went wedding dress shopping with her. She tried on this one dress, and... Yeah, okay, she looked pretty good in it. But when she asked me what I thought about it, I just shook my head and said, Well, it's not very flattering, is it? She tried on several more dresses, but I managed to find fault with them all. Then, when I noticed how disheartened she looked, I patted her shoulder and said, Don't worry, Cynthia. You can always postpone the wedding until you find a suitable dress. She looked a bit taken aback, but then she just smiled at me and said, That's okay, Laura. I'm going to go with the first one. Ugh. Anyway, now the dress was chosen, so at least I could go home now, right? Wrong. As on the way home, we passed an arcade. Cynthia led us there and then excitedly challenged me to a game of air hockey. Then I said jokingly, Fine, I'll play, but if you lose, you don't deserve to be my mother. And guess what? She won! Ugh! And worse still, Megan wouldn't quit giving me dirty looks for the comments I'd made. Jeez, I was just joking. What is wrong with you today? I plopped down on the couch and blurted out everything. She'd take my side, right? Um, turns out, no, she wouldn't. What? You and Jaden aren't even official. But Dad loves Cynthia. They both deserve happiness. So stop being a brat about it. Then she stormed off to her room. Ugh, I feel like I'm going crazy. I have huge feelings towards Jaden, and I know he feels the same. So why can't my sister be mature enough to understand that and support me? I needed to vent to someone. Luckily for me, I had Stella. Why does no one care about my feelings? I can't be Jaden's sister. Um, sorry, Lara. I don't know what to say. Suddenly, from the nearby table came a lousy voice. So that's the reason why Jaden has to hang out with you? You're pathetic, Lara. Turns out we were so lost in conversation... We didn't notice Anna and her flock sitting at the table behind us. Actually, we've been into each other for ages. It's not our fault our parents made some dumb decision. Anyway, whether we can be together or not, it doesn't change the fact that you bore him so much that he'd choose watching paint dry over being with you. How dare you! She was about to grab my hair, but right at that moment, a hand stopped her. It was Jaden. That afternoon, on our walk home, I finally came clean to Jaden. I like you a lot. I have always been since I first met you. I know you like me too, but you think it'll be awkward because our parents are getting married. Maybe if we just tell- Laura, you're such a sweet girl. And I do like you. But just as a sister. What? How could he say that to me? He had to like me, didn't he? Feeling an unexplainable amount of shame and embarrassment, 
I ran away from him. As I lay on my bed and rubbed my tear-stained eyes, all I could think about was how unfair this was. So, by the time Dad called me down for dinner, and I walked in and saw how happy he looked, my anger got the better of me and I yelled, I hate you, and I hate Cynthia! How dare you try and replace Mom! Then I rushed back to my room. You really upset Dad. You know that, right? I didn't answer. I was also upset, but no one seemed to care about my feelings. Dad said we come first, so if you really feel this strongly about it, then he'll cancel the wedding. To be honest, I'm real mad with you right now. So? What about me? You're so immature and selfish! I didn't understand how my own sister could be so uncaring. So I screamed out. So what? You don't care that mom's being replaced by some fake woman? And what about me? Why does no one care how I feel? Oh my god, Laura, for once, this isn't about you! Megan rolled her eyes at me, then stormed off. Finally, everyone quit going on about the stupid wedding. But why didn't I feel good about this? Cynthia didn't seem to be coming round to our house anymore, and I noticed how Dad's cooking seemed to get worse and worse, until he stopped altogether and just ordered takeout. Meanwhile, Jaden wasn't anywhere to be seen at school. Stella asked around to find out where he was, and turns out he'd left, as he was moving back to his old town. No way! After school, I rushed straight over to his house and barged inside to find him and his mum packing. Are you... moving away? <sighs> yeah. I moved here to settle down and start a new life with Randall, and this house is for Jaden's future. But the wedding's been cancelled, so... I quickly asked Jaden if we could talk outside. My mom's cried so much. Randall's her soulmate, and she can't stay around her if she can't be with him anymore. The most annoying part is that she agrees with him that the kids must come first. So, I hope you're happy now? Oh my god, what have I done? His words were like a stab to my gut. Oh no, this was all my fault. I was so obsessed with Jaden that I didn't stop to think about what was best for everyone else. Without saying another word, I ran back home and burst into the kitchen where Dad was drearily staring into his iced coffee. Dad, you deserve to be happy with Cynthia. So, please go and tell her how you feel before she leaves for good. But it was too late. Cynthia and Jaden had gone. Just kidding! <laughs> Nah. Actually, Dad managed to catch Cynthia just in time, and he told her how much he loves her and can't live without her. So, guess what? Yep, they got married, and now they're both happier than ever. I've learned the hard way that being selfish and inconsiderate of other people's feelings for my own gain just makes everyone miserable, including myself. So, now we're one big happy family. And I suppose having Jaden as a brother isn't actually so bad after all. I was so nervous. Like, the most nervous I'd ever been in my life. I didn't even know it was possible for a press conference to get so crowded. Suddenly the flashes came at me from every direction. It was almost blinding. But the clicking didn't stop, as well as the sound of them calling my name. Hazel, look here! Here, over here, Hazel! Oh my gosh, why was this so chaotic? I started to panic, so I ran away, but I'd only taken a few steps before thump. Oh, these stupid high heels. Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. Well, let's be real. It's kind of hard to see anyone from this angle. Then from every direction, the reporters swarmed in like starving vultures trying to take pictures of me. I was still confused and didn't know what to do when... Gentlemen, please give her some space. Are you okay? Robert, my adoptive dad, came to help me up. Um, excuse us, this is her first time attending such a crowded event. If it's all right with you, we'll help her answer your questions. Phew, I'd finally escaped the chaos. Or so I thought. As soon as he got into the house, 
Robert shouted, Pamela, which gave me the fright of my life. Didn't I tell you to teach Hazel some manners? How could you let her embarrass herself in front of the public like that? Pamela looked mortified and kept bowing down and apologizing, but Robert was still furious. If this happens again, you better pack your bags and get out of here. I felt so guilty. It was all because of me that she had been shouted out like that. But I'd done my best. Clearly, it wasn't good enough, though. I tried to forget about it. But early the next morning, Pamela woke me up. She gave me a timetable and told me that from now on, I wouldn't need to go to school anymore and that a tutor would come to teach me at home instead. What? Why all of a sudden? I asked Pamela in shock. It was because of yesterday's incident. The mayor has decided that you need to spend more time learning the necessary etiquette. Are you serious? He can't just keep me locked up here. No way. Hazel? Listen. You should be grateful that you got adopted into this house. Keep in mind of everything Mr. Cornelius has done for you and obediently do as I say. Do you understand what I mean? Looking into Pamela's eyes, I knew I had no choice but to agree. (sighs) The day of the opening ceremony for the town hall had finally arrived, and I got to leave the house for the first time in a month. A whole month. Now was the moment of truth. In the eyes of the public, I had completely transformed into a proper, prestigious lady. When Robert started speaking at the ceremony, he announced a charity fundraiser for my orphanage in the hopes that children like me would be given a chance to live a better life. Hearing this speech, I could barely hold back my tears. I was sitting next to my adoptive mom, Eleanor, so I turned to give her a big hug. Suddenly, all eyes were on me, and it seemed I'd finally done something right. I smiled up at Robert and we both had tears in our eyes. Maybe Pamela was right. I really was lucky to have been adopted by such kind people. But as soon as we got home, things changed. My parents got all quiet and went off to their room, leaving me alone. Where was my praise? I'd done so well, hadn't I? Why weren't they happy? The following days, they still asked me to join them for their events, so I guess I must have done a good job. And while the media and public were around... They were all touchy-feely and affectionate towards me, constantly praising me. We must have looked like the perfect family. But the minute we got home, they'd ignore me, and if they wanted to tell me something, they'd get Pamela to speak to me. It was so flipping weird. I actually started to feel quite lonely and depressed. And even though I was living in the lap of luxury, I missed the orphanage. One day, Pamela's daughter, aka the only friend I had in this enormous mansion, Paisley saw how upset I was and asked, Hey, so why do you agree to move into this house? You're clearly unhappy here. Paisley got me. She was the same age as me, so we were on the same wavelength. I was nervous to tell her how I felt, but I knew she would understand, so I told her everything. The thing is, I actually have a sister. She's only eight, and she's called Amber. That's why I was missing the orphanage. She was still there. She's got congenital heart disease, so after our parents passed away, the orphanage couldn't afford her hospital bills. When the mayor's family decided to adopt me, I refused because I didn't want to leave Amber alone. But then Robert offered to pay for her medical treatments if I agreed. And well, the rest is history. You see, I can't just leave. If I did, what would happen to Amber? Oh, Hazel, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. But I need to be honest with you. One time I overheard Robert and Eleanor saying that you were the perfect girl to play this role. Huh? What role? That meant... Were they using me for something? It didn't make any sense, but those words kept lingering on my mind until... One time, Eleanor asked me to join her at a charity event, which she said was going to be broadcast on TV. Our job was to prepare homemade food and give it out to the homeless. I was so excited, but when I walked into our kitchen, I discovered the chefs had already cooked everything before the filming crew arrived. I was so disappointed and asked Eleanor about it. She just laughed and said... Oh, no. Sweetie, our job is just to look pretty and graceful in front of the camera. Then before distributing the food, she gave me a pair of gloves and said, Don't touch any of their hands, okay? They are filthy. Oh my gosh, how could she say such things? Oh, then it hit me. I understood what Paisley had said now. The affection and kindness that the Corneliuses were showing me was actually just for show all to win over the audience, a.k.a. the public, while this was their very true face. I had to do something about this. I couldn't let them keep on deceiving the public like this. 
So when Eleanor went to the bathroom and took off her gloves, I quickly grabbed them and threw them in the trash. When we went back out, a homeless man approached her to express his gratitude and asked for a handshake. Of course, she tried to refuse, but at that moment, the camera turned to her, so she had no choice but to give in. And you know what? The man didn't just shake her hand. He even pulled Eleanor in for a big hug. I couldn't hold back my laughter at how flustered she looked. Served her right. Afterward, Eleanor grabbed my arm and dragged me to a quiet corner. Then she said, It was you who did this, wasn't it? I pretended to have no idea what she was talking about, and this just infuriated her even more. Then later that evening when we got home, Robert was already waiting and shouted at me. What do you think you're playing at? I was confused. But then Eleanor added, Don't you ever mess with me like that again. Now listen closely. Don't you miss your little sis? Aren't you curious if she's doing okay or not? That's right. You better have behaved yourself from now on, young lady. I was so shaken by what they'd said. I didn't even want to leave my room. What if something happened to my sister? Then suddenly, Paisley climbed through my window into my room. As soon as I saw her, I burst into tears. Paisley, please help me with this. I need you to go to my orphanage and check on Amber and see if she's okay. A few hours later, Paisley came back panting. Your sister? She's not doing good. What? But hadn't she been receiving money for her monthly treatments? Paisley shook her head. The nuns there said they hadn't received a penny since you left. Now Amber is barely surviving. Paisley's words broke my heart. Those two had been fooling me all this time, and now my sister's life was hanging on by a thread. I had to get to the bottom of this. I walked past Robert's office, and that's when I overheard someone talking. Curious, I peeked in and saw a group of middle-aged men sitting around a table. One of them spoke up. Hey, Robert, the election day is coming. Is that little girl still doing a decent job? Oh, don't worry about her. She's just a silly little kid. She believes anything I tell her, especially about her sick sister, Robert smirked. How dare he speak about my sister like that? I had to do something. I couldn't let this vicious man keep on fooling everyone like he'd done to me. So I took out my phone and started filming. Speaking of which, how much charity money have we got so far? One hundred thousand dollars, Robert said. And the room was filled with praise. Gentlemen, by the time of the closing party for the charity this weekend, we should have almost $500,000 for the election campaign. As soon as I win, your business will continue to be tax reduced for the next four years. I had to cover my mouth to stop myself from gasping. So this whole time, he'd been exploiting me and the orphanage for his corruption? Gosh, I was such an idiot to fall right into his trap. Suddenly, my phone buzzed. Who's there? Robert shouted and rushed to the door. Oh no! Panicked, I ran, but not far enough before I tripped and the phone flew out of my hand. Robert and his men caught up with me, picked up my phone, and deleted all my evidence. They even took the phone away from me. He turned to me and said, I've already warned you, have I not? You're a liar! I yelled. You haven't paid a penny to my sister! Robert growled. Who told you that? But all he had for an answer was my silence and fuming look. Furious, he dragged me back to my room. Maid, bring me the keys to her room. And then he locked me up inside until the day of the closing party of the charity rolled around, where they'd be announcing the amount of money they'd collected. That day, all the staff were out of the mansion. Suddenly, I heard the door being unlocked. Panicked, I hid behind the closet. Hazel, where are you? Oh, it was just Paisley. Ah. She found a way to sneak me out of the mansion and told me to run straight back to the orphanage. But no, first I had to expose that sly old fox, Robert. Luckily, when I got to the event, Robert was giving his speech. I immediately ran up to the stage, snatched the mic, and told everyone about his evil plan. But I was no match for him. Before I could finish, security was dragging me off the stage, and Robert had already taken control of the situation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so sorry for my daughter's behavior. She's... The reason why we decided to adopt her was that she's mentally ill. Since she came to our home, she has become better, but as you can see, there's been a bit of a relapse. What a snake! This jerk would stop at nothing to get what he wanted. 
Just then, the big screen on stage suddenly showed the video I'd taken, revealing all the schemes of Robert and his accomplices. Now he was well and truly exposed. I watched as he stammered. No, this can't be happening. Right at that moment, the police rushed in to arrest Robert and his accomplices in the stands. You might be wondering how we pulled that off. Well, as I was running through the hallway, I managed to send the video to Paisley. As soon as she received it, she came to find me and saw everything that had happened. So she secretly ran to her mom for help. Pamela then made a plan. While Paisley freed me from the mansion, Pamela set to work on projecting the video on the big screen. Genius, right? A month later, Robert and his accomplices were arrested for embezzlement. And, of course, he got locked up for a long, long time. Both him and Eleanor received such massive backlash from the public, to the point that she had to stay hidden away too. The charity money, luckily, was brought back to the orphanage, and part of it was used to take care of my sister Amber. She's doing much better now. Oh, and Paisley and I are still best of friends. Pamela has found a way better job. And as for me, I went back to stay at the orphanage until I'm old enough to move out. I'm better off being on my own with my sister than being adopted by some mess- Ugh! Why wasn't this jerk opening the door? I carried on with my thudding until my hands hurt. So it seemed like she'd gone already. What a sly fox! So the woman who lives here is my mom's friend, Carol. My mom, being the kind-hearted person she is, lent her some money to get herself out of a tricky situation. The problem being that Carol hasn't paid it back, and now she was ghosting my mom. Do you know what the worst part is? That money was for my college fund. Fueled with rage, I kicked the air to release my anger. But, oops. I watched in horror as a pebble flew through the air in slow-mo, then hit a car window. Oh, dear. Swallowing my fear, I snuck closer to the car to inspect how bad the damage was. Suddenly, the car door opened and two thugs stepped out. I tried to stay calm, apologized, and offered them some money as compensation. Unexpectedly, these guys grinned. Okay, sweetheart. If you want to make up for it, then follow us. Just like that, one of them grabbed my wrist and pulled me away. Ugh, as if they were going to harm a defenseless girl. But too bad for these two doofuses. They're actually looking at a Taekwondo black belt master here. I was about to throw an axe kick when suddenly a guy appeared out of nowhere. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Before I had time to blink, he lunged at the guys like a warrior and ended up beaten black and blue. <sighs> really? Who's rescuing whom now? Without hesitation, I threw a few kicks that made the two thugs turn pale. They ran back to their car, and when they were out of my kicking range, they turned their heads and sarcastically said, We spared you this once. Oh, and choose a better boyfriend next time. <laughs> I looked down to see the pathetic guy writhing on the ground. Oh yeah, I'd almost forgotten about him. He was pretty useless in a fight. But hey, at least he tried to help me. So I took him to a nearby medical station to bandage the wound. His name's Tyler. He's skinny, but yeah, pretty heroic, I must say. He still seemed to be in pain, so I offered him a ride home. But he quickly refused. Okay, fine. He must have been scared off by how fierce I appeared to be. Yet, as soon as I turned my back to walk away... Wait, something's wrong with my phone. What now? Your number isn't in it. Man, it's 2022 already, and he's still using that outdated pickup line? Still, I burst out laughing, then put my number in his phone. After that, we started messaging every day. He sent the cutest memes, and it made me feel good. To be honest, I know I can be kind of intimidating, so having a sweet guy like Tyler take an interest in me made my heart flutter a little bit. And there's no denying that he's cute. A real softie. Well, he is a music school student. A legit singer-songwriter to watch out for in the future. And so, you know, we became a couple. However, it didn't take long for me to realize that there was something very strange about this guy. I mean, 100% of our dates were at fast food restaurants, and while I was ordering a Coke, Tyler would ask the staff for an extra cup and ice. 
I still remember how surprised I was when I first saw him surreptitiously pull out a bottle of dark-colored water from his pocket. Oh, but you're not meant to bring outside drinks in. Don't worry, this is black coffee. It's basically the same color as Coke, so no one will know. Huh? Did I hear him wrong? Turns out I didn't, as this became a regular occurrence whenever we were out to eat. <sighs> but that's not all. On a rare occasion, we went for a fruit salad with burrata cheese. I almost choked on my food when Tyler took out a container of yogurt and tipped all the fruit on the plate in it. Well, and here comes fruit yogurt, but I'll put it away for later. It's not so right to eat this here, isn't it? <laughs> then one day, when it was our third month anniversary, Tyler said he was going to take me to this amazing French restaurant. Wow, I was so excited as he finally broke his rules. But turns out, it was just going to be another typical Tyler date. Things had gone wrong since the first minutes. When he parked up, he started searching his car for change. He even made me look down the side of the seat. Why, you ask? All because the meter was two ninety, but he didn't want to pay $3 and lose a dime. Seriously, a dime! He ran off to find it and left me sitting there alone and hungry for 20 minutes. When he returned, he had this huge grin on his face as he waved the dime in my face. Oh boy, I was so mad. You're probably thinking it couldn't get any worse than that, right? Wrong. Not only did he order a starter as a main dish, but he also asked if there's a discount if he didn't get dressing on his salad. After eating, he rushed off to the restroom and left me with his wallet to pay. He arrived back just as I was about to tip the waiter $10. Seeing this, Tyler leapt across the table, grabbed the $10, and switched it for a nickel. Yes, I repeat, a nickel! Meanwhile, the surprised waiter sarcastically said, Sir, thank you very much for my nickel tip. The customers close by all tutted at us. I sunk down into my seat, willing for it to swallow me up. Jeez, this was so humiliating. No surprise, I was in a bad mood as we left the restaurant. I was so annoyed I couldn't even look at him. He tried taking my arm and asked me what was wrong. Flinching away from him, I said, Seriously? Do you even have to ask? At that moment, a luxury car pulled up alongside us. The car window lowered, and O-M-G. Inside was Victoria T, this popular teen singer. Before I could register what was going on, Victoria sarcastically said, Oh, look who's here. Isn't that my poor ex? Can't gold dig me so you turn to this girl, huh? But your new plan doesn't seem to be working too well either, honey. And the car sped away. So, it turns out he's a professional gold digger? I mean, he hadn't actually asked me for any money, but there's no denying he was stingy. No wonder he never took me back to his place. There was a time when I was so tired of some family stuff at home that I just wanted to come over to his and rest for a while. But he made some excuse about his house being messy. Now I knew he was just keeping distant with me, so later he could dump me easier without any attachment. <sighs> I was so furious I made a scene, meaning to expose his cheap shots for the whole world to see. Tyler was so embarrassed he fled the scene right away. Whatever. Good riddance. And since then... I didn't hear anything from him again. But, to be honest, I also felt a bit empty not having him around. I missed getting the cute messages he used to send and the soppy look on his face as he sang love songs to me. Oh boy, I'm a big cheese ball, aren't I? Then, one weekend afternoon, I was taking a walk when I happened to see Tyler come out of a cafe. Um, does he work part-time here or something? So I hid behind a corner and then followed him. I have to admit, I was curious about where he lives. But wait, this road is so familiar. Huh? And it led to Carol's house, the woman who borrowed money from my mom. I was still full of doubt till he pulled out the key to open the door. Ugh. 
Like mother like son, huh? So, you both like to scam people, huh? Pay us back now. Er, uh, Stacy? Shut up! Scam's over. Pay us back. I'm sorry, but my family is... My mom's in the hospital now. So, I heard him out, and turns out it was just Tyler and his mom, and his dad had run off with some other woman when he was just a little kid. Growing up, times were hard, so his mom borrowed money to pour into stock investments, intent on providing them with a better life. Unfortunately, this only led to huge debts. All this stress was detrimental to her health, and now she was in the hospital, and Tyler had no other way but to live frugally to pay all the debt and hospital fees. Stacy, I'm so sorry for hiding all this from you. I'll try my best to work to be debt-free and make it up to you. Oh my, my heart fell hearing Tyler say that. All the angst just disappeared. Instead, I pulled him in for a big hug. He was a doofus, and he was my doofus, and I wasn't going to risk losing him again. On my way home, I kept thinking about ways in which I could help Tyler. Suddenly, the wind blew a poster across my foot. A city's television singing competition with the prize up to $20,000. That's it, Tyler. Why not? This was definitely a sign. I sent Tyler a picture of the poster and told him he had to join. He was also really keen on the idea and started practicing really hard every day. He texted me each time he finished practicing, sometimes even at 2 or 3 a.m. The big day arrived. Tyler looked so cute in the suit I'd arranged for him. When he hit the chorus, our eyes met, which made me feel so sentimental. But out of nowhere, Victoria got up on stage, snatched the mic from his hand, and said, My apologies to the audience, but I have to expose this person. He and his mom manipulated people into giving them thousands of dollars, then never paid them back. This kind of man doesn't deserve to be here on the stage. He'll stain the whole competition. Vic. I appreciate your feelings for me, but I already have the one whom I want to protect. I wish you could find someone good for you and better than me. Ladies and gentlemen, it's true that my family is in debt, but we do not and never run away from this. No matter how tough our lives are, I still live true to my conscience and my passion for music. I came here with a pleasant and carefree attitude, so I don't care what people say about me. I just want to give all of myself to music and the audience. Thank you. And now, I'll carry on with the performance. And then, he started singing the song he wrote for me. At that moment, the music nerd was no longer there. Instead, there was a man with incredible inner power. I'm so proud of you, Tyler. Guess what happened next? Tyler won the first prize. I was bursting with pride. Then he immediately came to my house to give my mom the money. Huh? Please take it. Thank you for helping my mom when she had a hard time. Please find it in your heart to forgive her. She's sick and could use a good friend. Oh, but the thing is... So, turns out, Tyler's mom didn't borrow my college fund money. The two moms talked each other into stock investments. When they lost it, my mom didn't dare to tell my dad and me what she'd done, so she fabricated the whole lending money story. Ugh, mom. Unacceptable. After that, the three of us went to visit Tyler's mom at the hospital and gave her the prize money to pay off her debts. She burst into tears. Then the two moms hugged and apologized for being so stupid that their kids had to deal with the consequences. Crazy, huh? But you know what? Thanks to all this drama, I found the one who was also the debtor of my life.